Δεν έχει ρεκόρ στο cloud επιλογή. Στο cloud. Είναι αυτό το cloud το ρεκόρ. Ο Τζέιμ είναι αυτό το cloud. Okay, good morning. Uh, let's start. Okay, I think based on the instruction, I should sit here because uh, we have online people. Uh, they want to see me, probably that's the best way. They can see my face, they can see how, uh, you know, we can discuss. Okay, so this is a tutorial. It's a long tutorial total. There are two sessions, uh, three hours. Okay. So feel free uh, if you think the first part is more interesting, you stay the second part is less interesting or vice versa, you, you have the whole choice. But I should say the second part is not strictly depends on the first part. That means if your first part, you missed some part, you should not worry the second part, I believe you still can understand it, okay? So this tutorial, we got uh, three people. Uh, I first probably show you the, the three people, the pictures, okay. Uh, the first one is uh, Yu Zhang. Uh, he is a PhD student of mine uh, in my group. Uh, the second one, Yu Zhang, he is also a PhD student in my group, okay. Uh, but they two will not be able to come because, you know, the. They, got, they are international students. They get out of the States and going back. Uh, it's quite complicated about the visa. So they will not be able to come, but they do have a portion of the tutorial was recorded by these two students. Uh, they are going to show it. At least you know what they are doing and uh, they, you probably also got a feeling how good they can present nicely, okay. So uh, for me, I'm a professor in uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I have been in this research field for a long time. So if anybody still uh, remember for EDBT when they first started, the EDBT first started as a biannual conference, that means every two years get one. Uh, the other year is ICDT before they finally merge into one conference, okay. Uh, I actually got quite a, uh, many papers at EDBT when they were separated, like a biannual. I remember 1988 or 1992, I actually came to Vienna. I remember that year EDBT was in Vienna. I also remember after the merging, there was one year EDPT 2009 was in St. Petersburg in Russia. I actually also attend that conference. So that's why I remember quite a many EDPT conferences. Okay. Uh, but many years I have not been working in the, in the exact field of database systems. I work more on data mining. So you probably, if anybody goes to say KDD conference, you will see me more often. Uh, but for like a VRDB, Sigma, or EDBT, I come less often. But this time uh, I actually came to give a tutorial, uh, to, maybe to somebody's surprise, it is not exactly on database, it is not exactly on data mining, but it's more on the pre-trained language models, which actually is on more like a natural language processing text data. But that's my group currently focus on, okay. So uh, then you may wonder why I changed from database finally to text, okay. But I should say, both database systems and text are working on data, okay? That's the same. 
But the difference is database just the majority we work on structured data. But the text is largely unstructured. You can say semi-structured, but if you if you are in database system, you know semi-structure means what, right? You still have different kinds of records, like object-oriented systems or something. But the unstructured data text is very messy. Okay, in the sense, whatever you want to say, you just say it. Okay, you write it. But why we work on from the structured data in database system to unstructured data in text systems, just because the majority of the real world data, like if you go to news, research papers, you know, many things, the majority of the data is unstructured. People actually got a uh, statistic said over 80% of the world data is unstructured text data, okay? So, to make sure we can handle all kinds of data nicely. That's why my group actually jump into the text data, okay? For the text data, uh, my discussion essentially is on four major parts. One is how to represent text data, okay? That actually, uh, recently you probably heard machine learning, there's a branch called representation learning. There's an email conference called International Conference on Representation Learning, ICLEAR, okay? That's exactly uh, how to represent text data, okay? Then second one is how to mine the topic structures. That means whether this document or this uh, corpus, what kind of topics they are addressing, the topic structures. The third one is mining document structures like uh, the document classification so you give me a document to whether automatically you can say what it is okay the fourth one is on mining entity structures that means we go, go down to inside the text to see phrases entities their relations taxonomies so how can we do this effectively so that's my lecture mainly based on this okay now people may come to say, oh, if you discuss this, say, five years ago, you probably could be very fashionable. But now we got chat GPT, we got GTP4, you come probably too late. Uh, why you are still, still interested if chat GPT can do a lot of things? Why you are still, say, ask many researchers to delve into it? Okay. So first look at the chat GPT. Okay. ChatGPT essentially is a chat or conversational version of GPT. GPT means generative pre-trained transformers. Okay. So we are going to discuss what is generative, what is pre-trained, what is transformer. Then we get into this to see how good they are and whether we can do something from the research side. Okay. So this chat GPT was done, was just a, released a few months ago. <clears throat> you, we already see within two months, we got into 100 millions of users. It's a uh, jumped very fast into this domain, okay? Then we get into, if you look at this curve, I give you a lots of bar charts, okay? What does bar charts mean? The bar charts, if you look at the, the lowest part, the, the very low part, we have like a Arbor base. Okay, let's get into this. We get an Arbor base, we get a like a bird base. Base means very basic, very lean model. Okay, that base you can see because this, this unit is millions of, you know, like a, uh, we should say, the memory model, the we essentially is, if you look at number of parameters to say these pre-trained language model, okay? The bird base is 110 million. You already think it's quite big because 110 million, it takes even Google machine, you know, to train this take a weeks, okay, to get this, okay? 
But if you look at the, the largest one, of course, when I showed this was GPT-3. Now GPT-4, I actually do not really have the data to say how many million or billions parameters. But if you look at the bird base is 110 million, okay? And GPT is 175,000 million, or you say 175 billion parameters, okay? Of course, uh, chat GPT is based on GPT-3. It's 3.5, not three. Three is 175 billion. 3.5 is even bigger. And GPT-4 is even bigger, right? So you probably can see the size these are really the gigantic size comparing to all the other preaching language models. Okay. We're going to discuss this, how these preaching language model was constructed and why they need this billions of parameters to make it work better. Okay. But you probably saw the chat GPT, once it came, everybody got shocked because they can write poems, they can write code, uh, they can answer a lot of very tricky questions. People are thinking, oh, our intellectuals, even programmers or researchers do not need to work anymore. We just uh, click and uh, just uh, send a query to chat GPT, everything works, okay? But even the inventors, they dare not to say, or they don't want to say it works anything you like, okay? Because everybody knows the G the chat GPT or any kind of GPT or preaching language model may have hallucination problem. What is hallucination? It means they generate the answer. The naive people may read it and think it's very good, but actually it's incorrect, okay? I can give you one example, you probably will be convinced. The chat GPT may give you something which could be misleading, okay? I uh, just uh, before I came, I asked the students, say, we go to ChatGPT, generate a very simple answer to see whether this answer is correct. Okay. Feel free, you get any question, you feel free, you can raise question. Yes. Is, is it inherent in the generated preaching transformer that you can generate hallucinations or is it? Specific? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. The question actually is, whether generating this hallucination is inherent. That means sometimes they generate a really good answer, brilliant answer. Sometimes they generate the wrong answer, but they did not even know, okay? Did not even know means they cannot control, which is very true because these chat GPT or any preaching language model is based on deep learning, okay? The deep learning, especially the generative model, is based on what they, the data they have, but they are not repeating the data. They actually based on your training data, they try to reconstruct it. But the reconstruct it is in the neural network inside. They actually cannot control exactly what the neural network is going to generate. They generate something very similar, but you never know you generate it is a fact or is a faked one. Yeah. Tried you, you tried it. This. I, yeah, I can, I can show you a very simple example before we came here. Okay. I can show you one example. Okay. This, this black one, I can read it. Okay. My student, uh, this first author, Yu Zhang. Okay. I say, you generate one model, everybody probably be convinced. And he generated one, he just said, please list the title, venue, and authors of a highly cited paper on heterogeneous information network. Okay, because of my group uh, worked in the past, uh, besides uh, database and data mining, we actually work on heterogeneous information network, made a lot of papers, many papers cited very popularly, okay. Then ChatGPT, actually answered, it looked like a very professional, okay? Said a one highly cited paper on heterogeneous na information network is, okay, they list a title, author, venue, everything's fake, okay? Title said, heterogeneous information network analysis and mining, colon, a comprehensive survey, okay? You go down to Google Scholar anywhere, there's no such paper in the world, okay? 
Then they list the author. They list me as the first author. They list the Michelin Campbell and the Jam uh, Jam Pei. These three, we jointly wrote a textbook called Data Mining. Yeah. If you look at that, if you buy a not the fourth edition, but third edition textbook, that's exactly three author list in this order. Okay, but that's a data mining textbook. It's nothing to do with heterogeneous information network. Uh, and plus, Michelin Camper never studied anything on uh, heterogeneous information network because he followed me work on PhD. And, it, and it is already, everything was more than 20 or 30 years ago. That time there were no heterogeneous information network. You probably see, author is faked, venue is faked, title is faked, but they look very authoritative. And moreover, they say, the paper has been cited over 43,000 times, according to Google Scholar as of March, 2023. Okay. Okay, so thank you. I will move it around. Okay. Yeah, you'll probably see, they even give a concrete citation number. There were no such paper. How could it be cited? 40, 40 100 papers and as um, March 2023 right here. So it's kind of a complete lying. And, it, and if you read it, then say making it one of the most influential works in the field of heterogeneous information network analysis and mining looks very authoritative. But actually there were no such paper at all, not to say cited 4300 times. So that is a very clear proof. You know, it's hallucinating and it does not really recognize it, right? Because if it recognizes your high data, it will not generate it out as the output, okay? So the problem, one problem could be ChatGPT can generate many things, but whether there's any mechanism, you can say this general thing is wrong. Okay, like this one. Okay, that's actually if if you think we as a database person, we probably say it's not hard to make it to make some verification. How to make it? Suppose there's a Google Scholar. Okay, I type a query inside. I say this paper. You go to Google Scholar. We did it. We we put this one into the Google Scholar. Google Scholar cannot find this paper because there were no such paper. Okay, that means. If you have structured knowledge, structured data, the structured data store in some way you can retrieve, like Google Scholar, you can immediately verify this chat GPT at this point was hallucinating, it was not generally the right one, right? But the majority data, when you really play with chat GPT, you have no way to verify it because this one we know is some kind of semi-structured data we can use Google Scholar to verify it. If you compose a poem or something, or you write a, some kind of thing, you do not know whether their word is indexed. There's no way you can verify it, right? So you probably can see one way we can guard against hallucination of ChatGPT is structured knowledge. That means if in the word knowledge of the text, we can structure it, then we can say this one is hallucinating, this one actually is not, right? You probably can see that. And moreover, if ChatGPT or their inventor, I mean, OpenAI, okay, they can construct the structure knowledge they will not let this chat GPT even generate this hallucinating nation because it damages their reputation, right? So what they do is they can take this structured knowledge base, you chat GPT generate something they cannot control, but they can go against the structured knowledge to say, no, this actually should not be output. Then they kick it again, say, you generate another one, right? Let me generate two or three. Finally, say this one actually based on my hallucination checking is in the structure knowledge, or somehow I can derive from structure knowledge. Then I will give you a good answer. You probably can see 
how important this structure knowledge is. But the current world, we don't have structure knowledge. Okay. That's why you use ChatGPT is on your own risk. You may enjoy it, but if they generate something wrong, nobody can tell you. Okay. Who can tell you? Structure knowledge, right? You probably can see. So that's this this tutorial is about. That means we're going to discuss from large tech space, how can we generate structural knowledge? That may eventually help everybody, including help ChatGPT, if they can get this. Okay. But I guess we use, like, seems like structure now is a very important learning phase of ChatGPT. Yes. Right. So once you have structural knowledge, many things can fall into order. Okay. That's what I actually got uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, NSF, the United States, US NSF actually got a workshop because they got this ChatGPT challenge as well. They want a bunch of researchers working on both in the academia and industry, like uh, you know Amazon, like those industry major leaders coming together to have a workshop the workshop actually says, how can we face the scientific AI revolution? Okay, that means AI can enable the scientific resolution, revolution, but we have to deal it correctly. They ask all the, those experts to get together for two days to discuss this issue. Okay, I attend this, I can show something like this. <laughs> they actually got amazed. I just mainly mentioned the structural knowledge is very important, okay? Now we get into our lecture, okay? The lecture, first I'm going to introduce what is preaching language model? Why this one is magic is important. I take a bird as a major example, but a GPT I'm going to mention it. I'm going to give you a bunch of existing preaching language model to say how they work, okay? and how we use it, okay. So now we get into second question is the second part of my tutorial is on how to mine topic structures. That means if you give me something like this, okay, you give me a large corpus like archive, then you say, I have different disciplines like mass, physics, computer science, biology or something. I put it down there, okay. Can you automatically, based on the corpus already stored in each one, can you finally give me all these different uh, terms, like mass, what are the terms, physics, what are terms, computer science, what are terms, can we do this automatically? Okay. So this is the topic we are going to discuss. Then the third topic we are going to discuss is about text classification. Text classification means you get a lots and lots of papers. Of course, this is not uh, we show scientific papers. You actually can think this is a Yelp review or Amazon, you know, like a reviews. You can put it down there, social media. The problem is you get any paper. Can you automatically put this paper into this queue? We call this one as a text queue. It's like a data queue, but the difference is. Everything inside is text, okay? Suppose you can have this one, like a, uh, one part is a venue, like a KDD or, or EDBD, those venues. The other one could be topics. Topic, you can have hierarchies. Like you may have text mining, under text mining, you have different issues. Then you have ears, okay? If you can automatically put every paper into the right spot, the the study, the statistics, or any kind of a general summary or something on this will become very easy, right? So that's the text classification. The third one is a phrase mining. That simply says, you give me large documents, lots of Amazon reviews or something. Suppose this one is about, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I think this uh, is TripAdvisor, if you look at the, 
the two, you know, like uh, our, you know, those kind of things. The trade advisor, actually, trade trip advisor in 2015. Okay, uh, they they send us a block because they are interested in getting the phrases. Okay, what are the phrases? For example, you look at this, catch a show. Okay, you get a Broadway show, you know, Beacon Theater, Broadway Dance Center. Those are related to catch a show. Then you say near the High Line, you get into High Line Park, Chesley Market, all of these things. Can we get this automatically? And can we get this? in any language. That's exactly chip, chip advisor needs because they are dealing not just English, you know, like a Greek, like, a, you know, a Spanish or even Korean. They want automatically show this. Okay. And they found our phrase mining tool is extremely useful for this and it works for any language, how it can be done, okay. And another thing is when COVID-19 came, okay, Trump the administration that time was a little panic. They basically sent an email to all the scientists in the US say, can you automatically dig in the biomedical literature to find any research literature related to COVID or related to that virus? can we de quickly develop methods to control the disease? Okay, so that's a time we, my group actually jump, jump in, say to get this article, very important thing is you get it because nobody said how to cure COVID-19 COVID because the, it was so new, right? But many articles inside may be re related. How do you get insight you go inside this article, you try to automatically type every phrase. Okay, that means, for example, if you say SARS-CoV-2, you automatically type this one, it's about the coronavirus. Okay, you get a polygeneric, you type this one, it's evolution or something like a pangolin's wildlife, if you can, automatically extract the, send, the the phrase and type it. Then we have search engine, we can do this, right? Once you can type it. So that's automatically typing this become a very interesting problem. We're going to discuss this as well. And another thing is, can we automatically generate knowledge structures? For example, if you look at data mining, can you dig out you know, like underneath data mining, what are the key things? Underneath machine learning or computer vision, you can automatically dig out these things. This automatic construction of the, we call it taxonomy or ontology structure is very useful, right? So that's actually, it's about this tutorial. The tutorial we're going to discuss one by one, each one how we did it or how other people did it, that form a tutorial. So you'll probably will find it's useful because even for database, you want to get structured data, but the real world is unstructured data. You want to build this bridge. And our research to some extent, or at least this tutorial, give you our research and other people's research how to deal with this, right? So you probably can see, we start with text corpus. We want to use existing knowledge base like Wikipedia. But other than that, we try to minimum or we try to restrict people's explicit annotation just because a lot of people hire lots of domain experts, annotate all these articles. It's very painful, it's not scalable, okay? So what we say is in, today's technology, we may not really need that, okay? What do we need? We need three things. One is very large unlabored corpus, okay? Second is existing knowledge base. Third, actually it's a pre-trained language model, okay? If we get these three, we work together, we will discuss how to get pre-trained language model inside this picture. 
Then we are going to see how to mine the topic structures, how to mine keywords, how to do classification, how to do knowledge network construction. We believe this actually is the key to turn unstructured text into structured knowledge. That is not just trying to solve chat GPT problem. Actually, before chat GPT came, it's almost the last 10 years we have been working on this. But even chat GPT came, we say, if they cannot solve the hallucination problem or explanation problem, this framework will give you hope. Okay, that's why even ChatGPT came, we say the study is still, still very valuable. Okay, because you probably can see if they hallucinate, you actually can know they are hallucinating, right? Now we will go down to our tutorial. Okay, so I claim uh, the tutorial, this one needs only five minutes. Actually, it took about 30 minutes. Okay, so let's see. I may not finish everything, but you. Uh, I just say, you know, we interact. You learn something real rather than you ask me to quickly go over everything you may still not quite understand. Okay. So feel free. Anytime you, you, you have questions, you raise questions, we can discuss. We make things clear. Okay. So the first thing I discuss is about preaching language model, where it came, why we need it, how we can use it. Okay. So let's first look at before preaching language model, what, ha what was happening, okay? We first look at static word embedding, okay? Even we trace back before word embedding what happened, okay? Let's look at this. If you look at the roadmap, this one we got is from some people in 2020 wrote a, a book, give a nice, nice timeline, okay? What do we show is this? In 1940s, when the computer just came, to about 1985, that area we call symbolic representation. That means people just use vector, vector space to represent the words. Okay. That's the time. But since then, we get into static embedding. That means we try to use distributed representation to represent the words to have less dimensions to deal with, okay? Then around 2015 down, people start working on contextualized embedding. We are going to discuss how the contextualized re embedding finally lead to the preaching language model generation, okay? So then you see the history, okay? Let's look at a very earlier history, okay? Of course, this is not dinosaur history. This, 1950s to 1980s, already our computer science dinosaur time, right? So let's look at how initially people are thinking about this. At the very beginning, people use, they call one hot vector. What is one hot vector? Because your document is a very long vector, okay? Every word only take one bit is hot. It means you only that one bit. Suppose I have one say, I like dogs. I, that bit is on, like is on, dog is on. That means, but that's, every word is one hot vector, okay? But you get a whole sentence where they are hot, you get those bits turned up, right? So you can see, I did, that's very simple. Dog, cats, cars, you give a different uh, one hot bit vector. Then you get a sentence, which part is hot, you put it in. Of course, later people say, oh, what about in my sentence, I have five dots. It appears five times. That's why this one hot vector finally become that hot like dog, it can appear five times, okay? Then you can use cosine similarity, all these to compute the similarity between the doc documents. But there are problems. The first thing is they isolate each word. They even do not care the, the, the orders, right? For example, you can say, uh, dog chase people, but then you turn it around, the people chase dogs. Uh, both actually the, the one hot vector, the, the, the vector is exactly the same, right? But the meaning is completely different, okay? 
So, but even that people actually use this using cosine similarity, they uh, get a D, you know, IDF factor, TF IDF, they got lots of things going along this direction. It helps initial information retrieval a lot, right? Even you look at a Google, when the Google is starting search, they start with the, this TF IDF, right? And then around 2013, Google actually pushed out a very famous algorithm called word to vec You still remember it? word to vec means the word I can turn into a vector. It's not the previous vector. It's a distributed vector, okay? That means instead of thinking you have a, you know, 10,000, you know, bits, each bit is just for one word. They have a much lower number, maybe only 100 dimensions, but they have a distribution, okay? You turn this into distribu distributed representation that get into the word to vec. What is the word vec doing? Is you map those similar meaning into the similar distribution in, in this vector. So like, a, then you can even calculate, for example, man sitting in a place, woman sitting in another place. Then you get a king sitting in a place. You actually can derive a king using this parallelogram, okay? It's magic, but it works. Okay, you can use algebra, you know, simple algebra can do this. That's the one people are actually working on in Euclidean space with small number of vectors or dimensions. The usual dimension originally you get 10,000 dimensions. Now you get about a one or 200 dimensions. And with this, people derive word of vec, globe, fast text. There are lots of different bigger companies. Word of vec was done by Google, globe by, done by Stanford, fast tech by Facebook. Okay, all these. We are going to first discuss this word to back. Okay. The word to back actually is nowadays, if you go down there, you say that's a very simple algorithm. 2013, Google pushes this out. What they do is they just compute based on large amount of text. They try to compute the co-occurrence of those different words. And how do you see the co-occurrence? It's not only see your own word, but you see in the in the text, plus minus k. That means you say, I like dogs because of something, the dogs are at the center, you actually get a likes or something or something, other things. You compute this occurrence in many, many cases. You finally doing this probability calculation. This is a simple probability calculation. This W plus T is a, center of your word, T plus J, the J can be plus minus K, okay? So in this way, you actually can compute the surroundings, okay? Then what you can do is you probably can see something similar like machine learning training or something can be very close. You can put them together, right? So that's the what word of act is doing. Stanford, the second year, pushed out another algorithm called GLOVE. Uh, some people pronounce it GLOVE, right? But GLOVE means global vectorization, global vector. Essentially, is you take the real world context co-occurrences, you use matrix decomposition, decompose them into, <laughs> from the very high dimension, decompose them into rather lower dimension. And with this lower dimension, you actually can get a lower dimension vector computed. That's GLOVE, okay? But uh, this one is before the preaching language model. We're not going to discuss a lot, okay? But one thing I should discuss because we are going to use it is the spherical space embedding, okay? Spherical space embedding was developed in my own group, okay? We published this one in Europe, 2019. Of course, quite a few years after, you know, like a word of that. But what's the difference? Okay. The difference is this. Okay. If you look at Glove, 
like a fast tax or word of act, they all compute everything in the Euclidean space. Why Euclidean space? Anybody know matrix multiplication? No. Matrix essentially is sitting in the Euclidean space. When you do matrix multiplication, you time them up, sum up, up in um, X, Y, those matrix space is much easier. Okay. But when you really compute the world world similarity, you are essentially compute cosine similarity. What is cosine? Cosine is this angle. Okay. If you think everything is in the radius of one, this angle essentially defines a sphere, a ball. Okay. What do you say like a mass or algebra is very close? Actually, their angle is very close, right? That means in the spherical space, they are very close. So you probably can think about this. Suppose France and Italy are rather similar. Their similarity, when you compute them, they will be in a very small theta angle. But if you say ball and crocodile are very different, their angle, theta angle is almost 90 degrees, right? But if you want to compute France minus Paris, but the other end there is Rome minus Italy rather than Italy minus Rome, their angle should be almost 180 degrees because the two similar things, but you reverse them in the computation in mass, you should get 180 degrees. So all these can be computed in the spherical space. So if we can compute this in spherical space, our calculation of similarity will be more direct, right? So we actually develop an algorithm how to fold this, the whole computation of similarity in the spherical space. We actually show you actually can get much better results, okay? And then there's another thing is when you compute just a local similarity, that's what a word back doing is plus minus K. But a plus minus K depends on how big the K is. Sometimes you want to look at the context a little longer because some of the context can really tear beyond a sentence or beyond three or five words. In that sense, we actually put a document conditional probability under document into consideration. We derive a new algorithm. This algorithm shows actually the computation on the, on the embedding will be much stronger, okay? <clears throat> but I'm not going to discuss this, this because this one, it still came, even we published it in 2019, but same year, actually Google pushed out the spurt, okay? So you probably can see, uh, we came a little late, it did not impact that much, but uh, later you were, you're going to find that when we do the other computation, this one is still very useful. <clears throat> now we get into the transformer. Not sure our audience, you know, how familiar you are familiar with the transformer, but I assume because I'm discussing with our database fellows rather than you know, machine learning fellows, I probably need a little introduction. I give you a very quick introduction, okay? You probably know <clears throat> what is a neural network, okay? The neural network basically is a, this neural structure, okay? The neural structure have nodes and the edges link them, okay? But how do you train this neural network? Essentially is you use the training data at the output part. <clears throat> but this training data and your expected computed results may have some distance, okay? And this distance usually in neural network called this is a loss function, okay? <laughs> For this loss function, how do you train them? Is you take this loss, you go back, we call it back propagation. Go back to adjust the links. Okay. Adjust the links means you, if you read a little partial derivative, you take this last function, you go back to each layer, each parameter. You use the partial differential you know, equations or something. You just change the weights. <clears throat> then you learn it. Of course, 
you have to give many, many, many training data. And finally, this new neural network will be adjust the weights to fit almost all the data or the training data you get, right? This is what neural network, then they have the learning rate, they have a, you know, all these different uh, stepwise regression or, or gradient, uh, you know, descent algorithm. We're not going to discuss this, but you know, these are the major tricks, okay? Now we come to deep learning. What's the difference between neural network versus deep learning is the deep learning, the first thing is you get many more neurons, many more layers. Okay, the original neural network just like a three or four layers. Now you get much more layers. And you train a much bigger, quicker way. For example, instead of using CPU, use using GPU, using all these tricks, and you put a lots and lots of training data. Then with so many layers, lots of training data, of course, there are lots of other tricks like how to calculate the dropout, how to use the relu functions, how do you, uh, we're not going to discuss this, okay? But with the years of development, the deep learning one with different data sets, people develop different neural architectures, okay? The first one, the multi-dimensional data, people using feed-forward neural network, the grid data like images, people using CNN, convolutional neural networks, okay? The, for sequence data, people use RNN, recurrent neural networks. For graph data, people using graph neural networks, GNN. So now you, of course, there are even more new, different neural networks. These are the major ones, okay? Since we are dealing with text data, we we can look at more on the RNN, the recurrent neural networks, okay? Recurrent neural network at the very beginning, people just use a simple RN architecture like this. They say, uh, if you want to evaluate a sentiment analysis, suppose I have, this was a great movie, okay? You take this, you use this network, you have each node, you link them together as a sequence. Then your new recurrent neural network layer will calculate all the differences, finally add them up or, you know, like doing some kind of function. That's the RN layer. Then finally you can output, say this one is positive, okay? But that one actually was quickly, people found this one, the RN structure was not a very efficient, okay? The, the RN structure people already get into, they call long short memory, RSTM. But S, RSTM only was hard for probably less than a decade. Okay, quickly people found there are more efficient, more effective way to do it. What is the effective way? Is people actually construct this using the call attention mode. What is attention mode? Means you don't really have to, each one by sequence, A goes to B, B goes to C. A can go to everyone, okay? And what you need is, you just need to, to adjust those parameters or different attentions. So you, based on this, you can derive a much quicker, much more powerful network. That one, people call this as transformer, okay? The transformer idea is, uh, it's from 2017, there's one paper in archive called attention is all you need. That means instead of thinking they are really in sequence, they actually, one part can feed into everybody, okay? In that way, your computation can be much quicker, okay? Now we get into the transformer encoder decoder one. The general transformer architecture contain two kinds of things, one called encoder, one called decoder, okay? Encoder, essentially, for example, this part is too, I should make it a little darker. This one input is uh, French, say the Swiss ADDM, that means uh, I'm a student, okay? So you take this, you want to get into English, output is I'm a student, okay? How we can get this? What you need is you take this each word, 
of course, is a sequence. You feed into this encoder, okay? This encoder, each one, they register different parts of your sequence. And then at the, this encoder will go down in parallel to many decoders, okay? And using this architecture, of course, you still need a lot of training data, okay? But with this training data, you take this encoder decoder architecture, each encoder decoder architecture, you can see, we have self-attention, we have feed forward, these different modules, okay? And these different self-attention feed forward module as an encoder structure, if you say the three ADDM, you put it in, and each one will code a ve vector, okay? This vector, usually vector is pretty long, like, uh, you know, uh, about 600 lengths, okay, bits. You f put into this feed forward network, these feed forward network will aggregate your different sequence parts, and then they will feed into a decoder, okay? So let's go down into the typical transformer architecture, okay? The typical transformer architecture is each one, okay, you have, okay, this is here is too small maybe to read. You get token, each token like a CADDN, you put it down there, and you put into this multiple attention, you have feed forward, this module, okay. Take this module, you actually can feed in the middle of the decoder module. In the real life, they have multiple layers, like six layers, 12 layers on each one, each encoder decoder. Then they put together as a bigger neural network, okay. And this one, they actually have some part, if you see the some part is a little like, a, like the CNN kind of architecture, but the other part is a little like RM, uh, you know, kind of part. But once you get into this, how to learn them, how to trigger them, how to train them, become a lot of variation, okay? They are, if you really go down to transformer, you see in the last several years, there are hundreds of different kind of transformer architecture proposed, experimented, and delivered, okay? Uh, but the general one, the, the nice one for natural language processing is this, okay? Different from the typical image processing. If you worked or talked to anybody working on computer vision, they say, do you know ImageNet? Okay, what is ImageNet? They actually took millions of images. Human actually labeled this. This one is a dog, this one is a cat. How many labels? 100,000 labels for, for each kind of picture. They're very intensive. Why? Because think about a dog has so many different kinds of dogs and different kinds of cats. You want to distinguish them. You need human to give you a label. But if the language, you still rely on human to give a labor, you, you could be dead because there are so many different kinds of languages and there are so many different kinds of ways to say it. How people train it, they do self-supervised training. What is self-supervised training? Is you take this encoder decoder model. Now, instead of you say, this is something human give a labor is you take a Wikipedia, take, you know, like a newspapers, take tweets, take any textbooks or anything you can find in human writing, okay? You just take all the human knowledge. You think this human knowledge is in general, this is the way humans say it, it does make sense. Remember that training on the condition is human does tell you something sensible, okay? If you use, a, use something like a monkey typed big corpus you put in, you, you will generate garbage, right? That means human, you don't give any label, but you give the real human data. Billions and billions of these kind of a large corpus you put in, not only in English, in almost any language human created, you put in, you do this kind of training, then that pre-trained language model contains lots of knowledge. 
but in a form only the neural networks can understand it. But it's hidden, it's implicit, but it's very useful. Okay. Now you probably can see the trick. The trick is you build a very large model, but using very large data, but the large data actually coming from the human society, from human creation, right? So take this. That means you use all existing text cover can be our training data. You don't need any human to give you a label, okay? That makes whole thing fully scalable. That's what chat GPT or any kind of preaching language model rely on, okay? So that's why people will think it's magic, but it actually it's coming from human society as well, okay? Now, we look at the, the major architecture of different transformers. In today's society, people actually create hundreds of different transformers, but essentially it's three major things. One called encoder-decoder architecture, one called encoder-only architecture, one called decoder-only decoder architecture. That three things. That means if you look at that a small picture, okay, the left part is encoder, right part is decoder. Encoder, decoder means that both things are there, okay. Decoder only means only the, the right part is there. Encoder only means only the left part is there, okay. Of course, you go down the detail, there are many more details, but that's a general philosophy, okay. And how good they are, okay. The, Encoder decoder only actually can be used for like a translation, the most like a bar or T5, they do the translation really good. Okay. But encoder only, if you use those mask language model doing classification, this encoder only is really good. Decoder only model actually is very good for language generation, like a GPT, all the GPT series. Okay, GPT-2, 3, chat GPT, and GPT-4 are all decoder-only model, okay? But uh, we are going to get into a little more detail on this encoder-decoder things, okay? So let's go down to the decoder-only model, okay? So before we get into why we need this model, even we have word of act, okay? Because word of act is also trained using large real data set, you don't need to give a label. But what's the real difference between, you know, like uh, the difference is actually down the static versus contextualized embedding. Static means in word of act, you take a king and a queen, you don't care where, where this context of a queen, where this context of king, okay? Uh, of course, you say sometimes it does make a difference. For example, when you play chess, you may have a king or something, right? But a, a king or queen, both there. But it's uh, different from the real society king and queen. It, it, it is different, right? But if you think about this, the word of act thinking, I, I could take the word like king or queen, I put it out. I will have my interpretation, that's it. But the real life is more complicated. I just to give you one example about this bank. Right? If you say open a bank account, you, and a, you say he, she was sitting at the river bank, that bank will be completely different. So if you mix them up, it's more like a real apple mixed with your apple, say, phone. It will be a complete disaster, right? So we know that in the sense, the con contextual embedding is much more powerful than the simple embed. What we discuss the uh, word of act, those things are static embedding. Or we say it's more like a context. It's not context free, but it's kind of not really emphasized on contextual embedding. But uh, the one like using BERT or GPT, they are contextualized embedding. It's more powerful. So, of course, it's much bigger, okay? So the pre-trained language model is based on 
self sealed using very large scale general corpora, but we're working on contextualized embedding. Okay. Now, uh, the general model I probably should say is the general model for this is it called pre training plus fine tuning. Okay. Pre training means you get a really, really big corpora you put in to pre train this language. But once you pre train it, there are different ways. One way is you say, I'm not dealing with only very specialized corpora. For example, now I have a bio or a chemistry one. Then instead of use a general bird, they actually use a bio bird or a cam bird to do it. Another one is bird, the language model, essential was only when they train, they were trained based on called the next sentence prediction. But you say, I want to do classification. I want to do question answering. I want to do this. You need fine tuning using particular mechanism, like a question answering. You, you have many question answering pair. That time you do need training. You need a human to give you the right question answering pair. Okay. Then you do fine tuning on bird, on the pre trained bird. Then it becomes very useful. Okay. So that's a pre training fine tuning. Let's get into a little more detail on these mm -hmm. different models. Okay. We will discuss decoder-only mo model, which is also called unidirection model, because when they trained, they all go from left to right to one direction to do the training. And then we will discuss the encoder-only, which is a bidirection model. And uh, encoder-only, actually, lots of popular used one, like a BERT, XLNet, Electra, like Arbert, Roberta, all these is based on encoder. Okay. Encoder, decoder, uh, decoder, this is the people call sequence to sequence model. Okay. That one actually is used for natural language understanding and generation. And that one, usually T5, BART, these are the popular use, use uh, model. Okay. So let's first look at GPT. Yes, go ahead. Concerning the previous slide, uh, if you plan to increase, yes, um, is the, the, the amount of data compared to what you pay in case? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, of course, the bigger data is better, okay? But uh, it's much, much smaller than the pre trained language model. The, the pre trained basically is take as much data you, you can get. It's like a, they call word knowledge. You feed in, that's a pre training. But fine tuning usually gets subset. Okay. And for like uh, question answering, entity recognition, or these, you usually need a, the trained pair. That means, Question answering say this is question, this is the answer, this kind of training. That means you do need a human to give you something. Yeah. Okay. Let's go down to GPT. Okay, because uh, everybody now get a GPT three, GPT four. So people are very interested in this GPT. GPT actually is one of the pre-trained language models. That one is based on the the decoder only model, okay? The model actually uh, start with GPT, they call it GPT-1 now, but that's a previous, they just got this generated pre-trained language model transformer. That's why they call it GPT, but later they, they're adding more and more, become more powerful, become now the GPT-4 just uh, push out, I think just this month, right? It's already quite uh, earth shaking. And that model, if you look at the general architecture, that's a, that's a GPT general architecture. Essentially is you only use the decoder and you, when you do the training, you do the scanning is left to right, okay? What you see is you basically say, you wanna predict or calculate the probability of X this tune at the I's position. You look at the previous position. Previous position, 
you, you can see it's x i minus one uh, going back to x i minus k. You take this part as a condition. That means k previous token as your context. You want to find this case token. Okay, what's the probability? And you take this probability, you take their log, you add them up. That's your loss function for your language model. Okay, you basically based on this kind of uh, language model, you calculate your scans from left to right, one unidirection. You calculate all the probability one by one, and you feed them into your big neural network, essentially. Okay, and of course. Uh, you probably know the chat GPT is not just based on the human knowledge fit in. If human you use as a user, you use chat GPT, you mark say this one's good, this one's wrong or something, you sort of keeping the training data for chat GPT because chat GPT based on this, they fit in, they can do better and better. Okay. So that's general philosophy. Of course, there are lots of tech, uh, technical details. They may not even disclose it, but that's a academic paper usually just a, based on these general architectures. Say these are the general philosophy they are doing, but there are many, many details inside. We actually do not really know because they don't publish it, right? But that's about a GPT, essentially the decoder only model, okay? Now we'll, we'll look at encoder only. Encoder only actually was developed in Google called BERT, okay? BERT was, when they train, they use two direction, they call bi-direction training. That means they scan one is left to right, the other is right to left, okay? When they calculate, they, what they do is they call the mask language model. What is mask language model? Is they take this very big uh, string, they randomly take, put this position, they mask it, say this, suppose I do not know, okay. And they, when they, when they do this masking, in, in the real bird is they take a 15% randomly select the words to do the mask, okay. That's, that's why they say 15% was randomly masked. The model learned bi-directional, the contextual information to predict what you masked, okay? And this prediction, of course, to some extent is kind of a training for them because they predict it, they look at the real thing, they know how good it is, they can calculate the difference, they can reduce the loss function. They do this kind of tricks, okay? <clears throat> And when they train this, their goal, they're testing one called a next sentence prediction. What is next sentence prediction essentially is they take the two sentence pairs. One is like a, they call premise, one is your uh, hypothesis or assumption or something. So you basically train this as you try, try to Take the first sentence, try to predict the, the result of the second sentence. And what they usually do is they take some kind of mask down there then to see whether they generate the thing is correct or is accurate. Okay, so they take this as their uh, training goal. Okay, but they can add a lot of stuff inside. That means if you want to, this is the pre-training. When you do fine tuning, you can put a lot of different tasks. Like you can say, I'm doing text classification. I'm doing a, a yarn name entity recognition. I'm doing question answering. You take those, those pairs or those, you know, like uh, uh, data and uh, labels. That means the human actually give you the correct answer pairs. You put this one in as fine tuning. Then once you generate this one, it's good for your question answering you can use it. And they actually show their performance is far better than many previous NLP studies. Basically, they, I think they published the results, their paper, initial paper in 2018. And 
it's already uh, they put it on the archive it's already shaking up the whole world and lots of people jumping on try to compete with uh, the different people uh, different other models and they put their final publication in 2019 i think it's emrp or NACL, i forgot it exactly but it, it's published in 2019 and it immediately got a best paper award okay so that's about a bird and now the bird has been used almost everywhere, especially bird base is small. So almost all the research people jumping on just use bird bird base. Okay, of course you can use bird large as well. Okay. So after bird, uh, people actually push out uh, one called Roberta, one called Arbert. Uh, anyway, they put a bird at the root. They try to extend it in many different ways. Of course, with different domain, they have a cyber for science, uh, bio bird, a cam bird, you know, all these kind of different birds. Okay, but this bird is century general idea. The bird is an acronym. Of course, it's, you can say Sesame Street as a bird. That's intentionally to get this animal and a bird. But bird is, B is bidirectional. Okay, then you know why they call bird. So, you probably can see <clears throat> comparing to many uh, different methods. Roberta, what they do is they make the training model longer, bigger batch of the test data, uh, training data. And also they do not do next sentence prediction. Uh, uh, but the final result, uh, uh, Roberta actually shows they got even better results on many different uh, uh, benchmarks. Okay. Electra is another one. I think this one is from uh, from Stanford again. Okay. Uh, what they do is they uh, re they use a replace token de direction uh, uh, detection. They make the training more efficient. Okay. Uh, let me see how far. Uh, if you look at the benchmark, Roberta shows actually, uh, Electra shows they are stronger than BERT, Roberta, Arbarta, and XRNet. Uh, XRNet, I think, is from CMU. But what you probably can see is these several major research centers keep competing, pushing different, different models. Uh, but I should say, so far, BERT and Roberta actually was the most popular ones. But uh, Electra are gaining popularity as well. So you, if you, yeah, I think they are all somehow open. But uh, the major thing is the majority of people are not saying source or not. They are using the model because it's too big. You cannot train by yourself, even, even you have that. Because any of these take, I, I do not know how many GPUs, but in the order of hundreds of GPUs, and then train it for weeks to get this. Uh, it's a, just the thing of electricity is very costly. So that's why majority of people actually just take those things as a, as a model. They play with the model instead of reaching anything. Okay. So that's about the... Uh, then the encoder decoder model essentially is you, uh, there are two influential encoder decoder model. The, if you look at encoder decoder, it's a more like a complete, complete structure. Uh, they, they call these a sequence to sequence training. Okay. Uh, like T5, I originally thought if we got T5, there must be T4, T3. But then I realized there were no such thing because T5 essentially is the abbreviation of the five Ts. You can see text to text to transfer transformer. That's why I get a five Ts. There's only one T5, there is no T4. Okay. So it's not like GPD3, GPD4. That's a different generation, right? And for NRP people, especially for machine translation, a lot of people are using BART. BART is another uh, encoder decoder model, okay? Uh, but we are probably do not really have time to go very detailed, but you know there are so many. If you want to get uh, some survey, 
I, I can give you a survey. You, you actually can go to the Google, you know, you can look at the survey paper. There are quite a bunch of survey papers, but I should say every survey paper, when they list it, there are hundreds of different transformers. So the simplicity is very hard and so many people working on it, okay? Now we get into the problem is how we use the preaching language model, okay? The preaching language model is essentially used in two ways. One, they call it fine tuning. That means based on your need, you can always fine tune your preaching language model. Like what you said, if you want to use it for question answering, especially for your specific domain, okay? You can take that domain, that corporate in the local domain, you do the fine tuning. You can take a particular task to do fine tuning. So fine tuning is, has been very popular. A lot of people, a lot of companies also doing fine tuning on their data set, okay? So another very popular, especially recent years, very popular one called prompt-based models. Prompt-based model means you, gives you, when you do things, instead of it just that, you get a mask language, you mask this, try to say what it is. They try to de carefully design some smart prompt, okay? The prompt will give something you really like. So prompt is a way to explore the power of preaching language model. That means you ask the right question, they give you the right answer. You don't ask questions, they give you something vague. Okay, that's why prompt become very useful. Okay. So the first look at the fine tuning. The fine tuning you probably can see. BERT originally was used for next sentence prediction. But if you want to do classification, you what you need is you take the class labor model, put it in. You get lots of different, you know. Documents and class, you, you put them in to do this. And if you do like a single sentence classification, document classification, question answering, and you have a tagging, you have NER, you have these different tasks, you tune the, the basic model into different uh, fine-tuned model. Okay, that's a fine-tuning. Prompt means when you get into, for example, the prompt means this, okay. Uh, if you give, uh, 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 I think that at the end, you may not see it clearly. The, for example, suppose you're reviewing movies, okay. You get, you give, the first give a class that uh, CRS means you start with this class, uh, starting class. You have no reason to watch. It was, you put a mask there. The mask usually can give you good or bad or great or terrible, those kind of things. And then you actually take this as a, as a one. You can put other sentences like a fun ride, it was great. Or the drama disclosed nothing, it was terrible. You actually can take those things, the prompt. Then you train this in a smart way, you finally will give a very, very good answer, okay? Sometimes you may even give a bunch of choices of your labor, you know, potential labor range. For example, you say great versus terrible, and they will give you different probabilities, whether it's great, whether it's possible, uh, terrible. When they finally return it, the great may be 0.8, the terrible may be 0 0.2, then you will say this movie is great. Okay, so you probably can see the general philosophy for prompt is you have smart way to get the knowledge you need. Okay, so the preaching language model can do this. And there are lots of ways to how to do fine tuning using prompt to do this in a more effective way. And there are also ways to discuss about it. You use a few shot, zero shot, and uh, uh, one shot, okay? Give you the general idea what is, you probably in machine learning, people actually use a lot of ones called zero shot, one shot, few shot. What does this mean, okay? 
zero shot means you don't give any sample. There is no, no training. You just based on the preaching language model, try to get what you need. Okay, that's a zero shot. One shot means you only give one example. Okay, and that's still a big hint. Zero shot and one shot, the performance still could be quite big difference. And what is few shots? Few shots means you give a few examples. Okay, you give a few examples, you put into the preaching language model, they will give you something uh, interesting and nice, okay. So this one, I did uh, have quite a bunch of references. These, uh, I should say this nowadays, you go to iClear, you go to like EMRP or any of these kind of conferences. They, the submission, it was so hot. I believe the like ACR EMRP nowadays, these two, two or three years, they got over 5,000 submissions on the research paper. And even they got a pretty uh, stuff once every conference, they took over 1,000 papers. It's just, it's just a, the scare, you just can't hardly imagine. And you, 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 any researcher you want to trace 1,000 papers, it's not that easy. So it's very hard to just focus on certain domain to go, go in, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have only 10 minutes left. Uh, I actually only finished part one. Uh, but what I can do is this. I can break for, you know, two minutes. See anybody want to raise questions? Uh, instead, I'll keep uh, without any break. Any questions on this? If, yes. Yes. Yeah, the slides are, are available. I have a question in, in the, regarding the escape for the window. Yes. In practice, like how how many words do these? Uh, Oh, I see. Uh, in practice, when they train, they take, I think it's something like a 600, around 600, 512, this kind of, uh, as, a, as a window. That means when you feed in, they break your part into like a 512, this kind of block. Of course, there are some models, they take even bigger ones. But the majority take about five or 600 words putting in. Okay, uh, so the model is so big, uh, it's almost you can treat them like implicit knowledge base. That's why you can question them, you can prompt them. Uh, that's also why ChatGPT looks very smart. Like when you, answer, when you post questions, they give you some kind of a sensible, at least for a human, if you are not domain expert, you could be easily checked to say if this is a very good answer. Yeah. You said that the, the GPT model that you said the only. Yes. Actually, I use it very well. Yes. Yeah. Decoder only doesn't mean they don't have other functions. They trained the, the the way they train is using decoder to predict things. Yeah. But once they train this large model, they sort of they get a lot of things stored in their parameters. They can do lots of things, including machine translation. They can do it yeah. very good. Yeah. Yeah, but at the very beginning, when they design, they want to generate good sentences, generate a grammarly correct, uh, you know, in general, it makes sense in that way. But with the model growing bigger and bigger, the the application go well beyond their original design. Yeah. Any question? Teacher, and if I ask you something in French, you always respond in English. 
uh, on top. So it's a reformulation of this um, this task in here. Do you have any uh, experience on this? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, prompt is a is a big domain now in the study. They they call this one the prompt engineering. So you probably know that means actually to how to work out the prompt itself is a big trick. Uh, I mean, there are lots of research on it. How to work out what different tasks, what kind of prompt will give you better results. It's a, it's kind of a when the people started to say it's an art, you have to think a, in a very innovative way to write a prompt. But now people gradually know, you know what kind of prompt likely will be effective for what kind of tasks. There are lots of research paper on this. Yeah, I think uh, CMU last year pushed out a one, I think it's kind of called prompt engineering for the, the they have a survey paper right on this. There are so many different ways to do it. Okay, so uh, should we get into a new topic or we have only five minutes? Uh, I, I, I have a question in the chat. Oh, okay, sure. The question is, can we use such PLM models to deal with other data modalities such as triangular uh, cellular data? I see. Yeah, so I probably should say this. The, the current, like a chat GPT, I think is working mainly on the text data. But I was told that GPT-4 actually works more on multi-model data. That means if you give me a picture or image or some kind of a sound or something, I, I myself had no experience, but I just saw some report say they can work on the multi-model data. That's a GPT-4. They just pushed out uh, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, so I got no experience, but uh, the report people say is the newer one, even bigger one, they can handle multi-model data. But how well they handle, I do not really know. But uh, there are uh, different kinds of a generative model. I remember there was one is general pictures. Okay, That means you can write down something you like to generate. You say, I want a girl, you know, is sitting on the, uh, someplace uh, along the river bank or something. You write this, they will generate a picture like this. That there are quite a bunch of preaching language models that can do that. Uh, I mean, they generate lots of, uh, some picture really like an art picture. I, I watch it, it's, it's amazingly good. Of course, they have lots of training data on that, but that's not ChatGPT. Uh, I do not know GPT-4, but there are some uh, pre-trained language model. They can work together with, you know, a text. They generate images, generate very nice images. Yeah, there, there are quite a bunch of them. You probably know there with uh, CAN with the neural network ones. There are lots of people. You can say, I need this picture generating some like a different artist style, like a Picasso or like a Monet or something. They were generating a picture really look like that style. Yeah, that, that's quite magic, but uh, those are the computer vision people have been doing. Yeah, they, they, they use uh, CNN working together with the text, the GPT model. There, there are lots of new things. I, I should say, you know, almost every month you will see lots of reports on different magic they can do, which is true. Yeah, it's a very dynamically growing field. Yeah. Okay, so I think I uh, we are on the right on time. I will not go get into this. Obviously, this uh, I originally was too ambitious. I I, I got uh, too many slides. But I think it's good. You we get a limited coverage, but then we'll, we'll go along the line to get into next and uh, next topics. Okay. So in the afternoon, I'm going to start with part two, uh, mining topic structures. Then we'll see. Maybe I can get part two and part three, but uh, probably we'll never touch part four. That's fine. <laughs> okay.
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Oh, uh, I haven't loaded it yet. Okay, okay. What I will do is, if some part never covered, I probably do not need to load okay. that part. Okay. Okay. So again. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you uh, presentation. What time? Uh, four o'clock. Right here. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Oh, Zhao Wei Han. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, just see you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, congratulations for your, for your, uh, you know, the award. Yeah, thank you. Great, great. Yeah. So, we actually come in by Zoom. Yeah, so Zoom is still different from the real. Yeah, it's much better in person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. Great. Okay. Yeah, we work together. You know, I, mean, uh, I uh, um, you know more about Chad GPT than I do, but I, I was trying it recently. Someone showed me. I'm up. So I'm from Edinburgh. Yes. I'm I'm not really an NLP guy though. Um, I work with our NLP guys. Yes. Um, but um. This business of hallucinations uh, really troubles me because I don't see how you could trust the output from chat GPT in anything other than trivial contexts, um, given that issue. Um, and I didn't find it all that difficult to get it to, to produce spurious output. You know, I ask it to give me a summary of some future event and it gave me a summary of the event. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. But um, a person writing summaries like that would probably have a list of references at the end um, for the sources of the data that they were summarizing. Can chat GPT not operate in that mode where it, where it shows you the references that it's used? You probably can see. I'll just give you one example about the paper. Mm. They start hallucinating.
Yes. I think we have two minutes, so we we'll wait until okay. the right time. Okay, it's great. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So welcome back, or if you just join me in the afternoon, welcome as well. Yeah, so uh, this morning we discussed about the uh, preaching language models, okay? And we also said, if we want to help chat GPT or any other hallucination model, we actually, one important part is considering to mine the unstructured text to get structures, okay? So now in this part of lecture, we are going to discuss how we can mine the massive text data, unstructured text data to get the structures out, okay? So uh, I originally prepared part two to part four. So there are a total of three parts. Based on the morning progress, I think I probably can cover two parts instead of all the parts. That means we will leave the very last part of probably not covered, but it should be fine. I think you basically get the ideas. And we have lots of tutorials and also the research papers. If you like to read, uh, feel free. You can go to my website or uh, the first author of the paper or our tutorial website, you can download it. Every year we give uh, some, at least one tutorial in KDD conference. So of course, every year we update it like this one, we got lots of new results putting in as well. Uh, but feel free, if you find uh, some parts interesting, you actually can go to KDD conference, you look at my name or the uh, my group of students name, you can download the tutorial, including both videos <clears throat> and also the slides. Our, after tutorial, I know how much I will cover or just cut the part we covered, I put it on the web as well, okay. I do not know EDBT will collect this, but I will put, uh, they, they were, right? Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, our, it's great, it's great. Then I will put uh, my revised slides based on the coverage. I will send it, you a new version. That's great. Okay, so we did, the, the part two is essentially is we call mining topic structures. Uh, the general philosophy is this, okay. You get one document or you get a large number of documents, but before you read it, whether the computer can discuss 
with you what's the topics, no matter the bigger one, small one, what they are covering. Uh, that can help you to decide whether you want to read it or you want to study and doing some kind of summary, okay? So let's get into this part. Seems that the, it's not moving or something. Not quite sure. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. So you just need a cursor. So we will discuss, in this part, we'll discuss two issues. One we call unsupervised topic discovery. Another one is called seed guided topic discovery. Unsupervised means we don't tell you what topics we're interested in, but we may give you a number, say K. Say within this document or within the set of documents, find K topics. What they are, I don't know, you find it. I just give you one or 100 or 20 you find the topics. So that's the, we call unsupervised. Supervised or we call seed guided means for this particular document, you may say, I'm interested in, for example, you give me New York Times, I would say, I'm interested in politics, sports, and entertainment. You say this, I'm only getting those things in. Of course, you can give something completely different. For example, you say, I'm interested in Europe and US, no matter what, okay? No matter what topics I'm interested in this, I can, for the same corpus, you give me different seeds, are getting different things. That's could That could be quite useful because different people may have di different angle to look at the work, right? So let's first discuss about the topic modeling, okay? We call this one as topic discovery. But before us, there has been a very popular sub-community in computer science called topic modelers or topic modeling. We first discussed, we call this one as topic modeling because statistically you can model your documents using a set of topics. That's why in computer science and some in statistics, they actually create this word called topic modeling or topic words. But essentially the general idea is, if you get a large text corpus before you read it, you will to know what it is about. Right? You give a set of topics, it's always useful for many purposes. For example, you may want to do you know, document classification or segmentation, organization. You help your doing retrieval, doing ranking, doing summarization. So there are lots of things, topics is very useful. Okay. And at the around year 2000, okay, uh, there are a group of researchers working on this. Actually, I think the lead one was uh, Michael Jordan at Berkeley and also his PhD. One of the uh, famous ones, David Bly. Later, he, after graduation, he joined Princeton. I think now he's in Columbia University, okay. These groups, what they do is they use a statistic machine learning approach. Get inside the topic and try to figure out what should be the topics, okay? Uh, they mainly rely on two things. One is document, one is a word inside the document. You're basically doing word topic matrix and document topic matrix. These two matrix, they do back and forth, they generate the number of topics, okay? The general idea, the most influential one called latent deletely allocation or LDA, okay? Uh, if you work in statistics or you work in electric engineering, LDA may represent linear discriminant analysis as well. So sometimes people take this as a joke. So I just give you LDA what it is, right? It could be, Linear, linear discriminant analysis or, you know, latent deletion allocation depends on the context. That's exactly RDA based on different contexts. We generate completely different things. Okay. So, and you take this, you say, for example, you, you get this one, you say, I try to model, say, two topics. Maybe finally you will find. One topic is about politics, another topic is about sports, okay? 
underneath the politics, you may generate like a campaign speech, you know, like, a, you know, some kind of running for president or something. And under sports, you may say there'll be about a fans or about competition, about, a, you know, like a hockey or baseball. So you can see these definitely will make sense for a lot of analysis. That's why people want to do this. Okay. And what is the principle they are doing? Essentially, people actually work out, uh, you know, this kind of diagram. If you know the topic models, this is very typical statistic. It's, it's like, uh, you know, those uh, statistic models, okay? The model, the general idea is this, okay? If you see the black one, it's W means words. These are the words you really can see, okay? Those not, the black one actually is more like hidden ones. And you use your statistic approach to derive those things. What they derive, okay? One is we call, for any document, you may have a set of topics, theta. So you can take theta as a topics, then you use the rich allocation, you get the parameter, you can compute this, okay? And for every topic, you may have certain word distribution, then you can, based on this, you can work out that. And the details, the details, statistic modeling, latent judicial allocation, I'm not going to cover it, but you know is basically based on these diagrams, you use a statistic approach, okay? You can generate this. And then finally can generate, for example, you give me a number K, say K is 20. I can generate 20 topics with certain good quality, okay? But this is very different from like we discuss SQL. You will say SQL, whatever you get a database, you say now, you, you give me a query, every time I run, you get exactly the same results, okay? But this is a generative model. You run it differently, you generate actually different results. Some people may not feel very comfortable, especially in the database community. But in the AI community, there are lots of statistics and generative model. You call the same number K different times, you may generate somewhat differently. Okay. So you have to get used to this kind of mentality. Okay. Then the RDA basically is saying is one algorithm, of course, uh, there are many other different algorithms, different, uh, they, 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 are, they, they have a Gibbs sampling, they have different Monte Carlo simulation. There are many different ways to generate this. And uh, what we said RDA, just because this one is the most popularly used to generate it, okay. And then finally, you can generate a bunch of, you know, distribution of the words, distribution of the topics. And everyone, they have some number associated with it. Essentially you say, what's the possibility? What's the ranking? You know, you get, a, for example, you get a politics, maybe president, maybe war, maybe something may generate a higher probability than other things. So those are the things you base on your documents, how many words appearing in this whole document set you're generated, okay. And, that's topic modeling methods. Recent years, the people actually study, especially after embedding, after preaching language model, people want to re-examine this. Why? Just because the topic modeling is based on the word occurrences. Okay. <clears throat> that means this word, how many times occur in this corpus or in this document? But a word occurrences may not be very accurate because there are many similar words, right? Even we use RDA. The other guy said latent deletion allocation. These are looks very different thing, but it, they actually mean the same thing. And they are similar things as well, right? So if we know how to do embedding, we know how to do preaching language model, we should re-examine this, probably make it better, okay? That's what people in recent years, after coming with embedding, with preaching language model, they want to re-examine this, okay? And one way to re-examine it is, we still say unsupervised. Unsupervised means I don't give you 
any hint what I want, I just say, okay, you give me the number of topics I need. Okay. And then for unsupervised, people actually use called a clustering-based topic discovery. What is clustering-based? That means you want to K, I essentially are doing embedding or preaching language model. I put those words scattered around, but I may have a clustering algorithm finding K clusters. Okay. So let's see how people are doing this. Okay. So the general philosophy is topically topic method, topic modeling methods is using back of words. That means that if the politics occur many times, you will say this thing mainly about politics. Okay. Now you get into embedding. That means we were thinking every word is a distributed vector. Okay, it's a distribution of the topics. Then based on this, what about we have after, suppose you do word of act, you get say lens 100, 200 long, this vector, but it's distribution. Whether we can use this di distribution to do clustering, whether that would be better than you just use single word, but the word may be, you know, something very similar. You do not really think, no, they should be grouped together, right? So that's the one people using this, they call word embedding plus clustering. That means I first do word embedding using word to vac or many other methods. Then we do clustering whether we get better things. Okay, that's the recent, a lot of researchers doing this, okay? What they do is they use word similarity, then they do semantic uh, similarity computation. They use k-means or you know uh, maximum margin, those algorithms, okay? So you probably can see, yes, go ahead. Actually, yeah, that's a very good question. You actually can see the real study. People will take a K-means and a Gaussian mix model in parallel. They will see which one is better. Okay. Not necessarily, but uh, there's no very firm say definitely Gaussian mix model is better, but uh, it's kind of comparative methods. But that's a very good question. That's exactly uh, the, the researchers are doing this. Okay, they take uh, these two as the two major clustering methods. Okay, so you probably can see that's immediately getting into this one. You, you can see that clustering algorithm people study essentially one is K means, one is Gaussian mixed model. That's exactly these two as the two major methods. They, they, they see this, they compare this. Okay, but what, method, what embedding methods they do, uh, whether they make a difference. Okay. They do make difference. So you probably can see people actually studying. This one is by SIA in year 2020, published at EMNRP, that's a study. The study is essentially called Tired of Topic Models, and then clustering clusters of pre-trained word embedding make for fast and good topics too. So that's a title, it's pretty catching title, right? So what they do is they took six methods, six different embedding methods, then take a two clustering algorithms, k-means and a Gaussian mix model. The six embedding methods, Wurtovac, Glove, FastTex, spher spherical text embedding, Ermo, and BERT. It's interesting because we do not know this author, but this author actually, uh, word to back low way fast text is from Google, Stanford, and Facebook. Then they took our algorithm, spherical text embedding, simply says they think it's pretty cool. They put it in. Then they put Ermo and a bird. They put the six algorithms to do comparison. Okay, see how these six algorithms using K means and Gaussian mixed model, whether they can do better. Okay, so that's what they did. So the general idea is they still use, they based on some kind of word frequency, but since they have embedding, they actually take a weighted clustering 
based on the frequent words were weighted higher. Okay. Then they doing re-rank the words of in clusters. That means if this word is frequent based on embedding, it's a sort of cluster, they will run this word higher. Okay. Then finally try to find good topics. So that's a general philosophy. Okay. Now you see their major result table. What they do is they take this six methods and then try to see different large corpus. Why is the writers? Why is 20 news groups? These are very popular used in text community. They take this as a standard data sets. Okay. For these two stated data sets, they use different ways. But uh, they have the one we put as a dashed box are the method they call weighted clustering plus re-ranking. That means they have something like a not weighted, weighted re-rank and a weighted clustering plus re-ranking. The very last two row, two columns actually are the very final results. So if you do weighted cluster and re-ranking, you get better results, okay? With this, if you look at the overall clustering methodology, you probably can see uh, K-means or a, a, a Gaussian mixed model, usually it's the bigger, the better. The bigger means actually the, it's more clustered, okay? The, then you base on this. What you actually can see is this. Uh, among these six methods, uh, this is a little small, but I can sh say who will be the winner, okay? For the writer data, the writer, the left half, the writer data, they finally show BERT, actually comparing all these methods, BERT get the best one. But the spherical embedding get the second best. Uh, then the, like an ERMO and a word of back actually did not get that good, okay? It simply says, Bird actually is pretty good, okay. And then they use the 20 news group. They actually show similar results. What they see is a K-means, you probably, that's exactly what the answer the question, because if you look at a Gaussian mixed model and the K-means for writer data, Gaussian mixed model is better than K-means. But for 20 news group data, if you look at it, of course, it's slightly better. The K-means actually is the slightly better than Gaussian mixed model. So these two are like a rivals anyway. But among K-means, the highest one actually is a spherical embedding, but it's just a slightly higher. The second one actually is, a f is BERT and a fast text. Okay. So you, you probably can see, BERT is still doing very good. The simply says, you use BERT, use, use the, the good word clustering, word embedding methods. You still can do this to compete with topic models, okay? But this one is a little more deterministic just because once you do embedding, you run it again, the cluster essentially you get the same, right? So this is uh, the clustering based topic model, okay? Yes, yes. Yes. The less homogeneous will be the cluster, so that's complex. Uh, that's why I asked. Yes, yes, yeah. Actually, this uh, I should say definitely Gaussian mixed model has its value. You probably can see all these Gaussian mixed model relatively stable, right? If you look at it, <clears throat> right. But anyway, you probably can see. Uh, the clustering algorithm, of course, is important, but it's not a very decisive. But the embedding is more decisive because you actually can see once you get a good embedding, you always get, get better, better, better results, right? So that gives us a very good hint is 
if we do not want give the embed the seed or user guided one, we just say, okay, actually to what extent, if you do better embedding, you actually also can get better topic clusters, right? So that's the general idea. But then people may say, you said this, you said the preaching language model is pretty powerful. Why do you do clustering directly on BERT output? Okay. Uh, to our own surprise, we look at it, nobody directly doing the word embedding using BERT and then do clustering, try to find all the clusters. But we say, why there is nobody reporting this? Because originally you can see uh, when BERT came, they actually said almost any task they do, they, they are the winner, right? They can do classification, they can do question answering, they can do summarization, they can do you know many things. But nobody re reported they can do better clustering, like topic model. They can do better topic models. And then we tried to see whether how we do this. Okay. The interesting thing is uh, this one in principle I should use a color. You probably can see even better. We took Yelp. The left one is New York Times. The right one is Yelp. We take Yelp and New York Times, the large corpus. We say whether we can find good clusters. We tried, like you can set it, K, I mean, number of cluster is 50 or 100 or even 200 or something or two. We found it's even you visualize, it's very hard to find a good cluster, right? You, if you look at this visualization, of course you can enlarge it, but you see they are sort of very nicely scattered around rather evenly, it's very hard to find a good cluster, okay? Simply says, if you take pre-train language model like a bird, then you say, I map my article down to those things. I, you give me five, give me 10, give me 100. Can I find good clusters? The, gen, the, the simple answer is no, because you look at this, human cannot identify good clustering structures. This is more like you, you, when you learn Gaussian mixed model or K-means, people actually say, before you apply clustering algorithm, you, at least by eyes or by some kind of analytical method, you see their existing good clustering structures. Then you find cluster will make sense. If I evenly scatter my points into the space, see, when K is five or K is 10, K is 20, you find something, but they really do not represent good clustering structure. Yes. So is it fair to say because here we collapse everything in two dimensions. So maybe there are clusters because you are believing yeah. inside a way more higher dimensional. Yes, that's a very good observation. You say, because we, we map it from the 100 dimension down to two, you look at it, everything is, is, is you know, yeah. is collapsed, so you cannot find it. But the original 100 dimension structure, you may have good clustering structure. We actually finally studied this. We actually, in that paper, in the last year, triple W paper, we actually give a theorem. Say it's impossible to find it. The reason is this, okay, these bird or these kind of preaching language model, they are so nicely study your words and distribute them. Even within two dimensions, you cannot find nice structure. Within 100 and 200 dimensions, you still cannot find it because they actually did a really good job trying to scatter this around, maximize their distance. With so many words, you just cannot find nice structures. Okay. Uh, my student, Iman, he actually proved that one as a theorem. He put it in, say, just because they do so nice job. Within even the high dimension, they scatter it around to scatter in a very nice way. Just kind of, I then, clustering structure simply says some part is almost empty, some part is, is dense. But this word, they once they compute this embedding, they actually scatter reasonably nicely across all these dimensions. So that's a very good question. Then, but that's not our paper. Okay, that paper first give you negative results. 
then we try to get a positive ones by playing tricks, okay? So the, the, the first is, is the root of this challenge. That's, that means why we cannot find good clusters. It's just too many clusters. That means almost each one word, because of this embedding, they actually form independent cluster. They are not very far away you know, from the other neighboring ones, but it's just a very nicely distributed, even in a high dimension space. Okay, so that theorem actually he proved it using the Gaussian mix model, but I'm not going to get into this. Okay, but he found a way to do it nicely. Okay, that's the one. That's why he got this one into a triple W conference. That means if you're directly using the original Im embedding of of BERT. Okay, you just cannot find nice clusters because they are so nicely distributed. Okay, then what he did was he take this embedding going through another mapping, another transformation. The transformation essentially is using spherical latent space. That's exactly we, in the beginning, we mentioned this, this spherical embedding. Using this sparing embedding, remap the word and documents and their distribution, okay? That means we take the initial bird output, but we don't rely on bird output directly to do clustering. We go through another mapping from the original Euclidean space, map into spherical space based on their word document distribution, okay? So, yes. So, on your map, you just collapse to the, this uh, uh, sphere of the, the multidimensional. Not a directly collapse. Okay, that's a very good question. What we do is we look at the word and document distribution. That means we still go back to the original document, look at the document, how many words, what words they contain using this, but that time we take not a word but uh, taking their bird mapped one not the original word but map ba bird mapped one but document is still documented w the word is not the original word but a bird generated words so the embedding on the this of the space is the is the document embedding with the birds Yes, bird. Uh, now the the word is not a word; it's a bird embedded, a bird computed embedding, and using this map it into spherical space. Okay, and then you actually can see this. Once we map them into the new space, remember this mapping. Uh, if you know the spherical space, the mapping essentially using VMF. VMF means is uh, VMF is a mathematician called Fong Mr. Fisher. Okay, he did this embedding is embed everything into the lens of one. Lens of one means is in the spherical surface. Then finally, you compute the differences just to look at the angles. Okay, so that means you map all the words. After this one, you map them into a ball, into a spherical space, okay? And once you map into this spherical space, we transform the original, you know, bird space into this Z space, which is spherical space. Then we do redo this clustering. Then you will find nice clusters, okay? Simply says, bird still give you lots of hidden information, but, Bert originally doing the embedding was so nice. Every word almost have the equal distance or they are, you cannot find a clustering structures. But if you map them using re-examine the word document co-occurrences, you map them into this new space, the clustering structure appears, okay. You actually can see the general game in this, okay. When you first take this word, you do BERT, okay? 
you map into this attention-based document embedding space. Then you take a word document, this embedding, you redo this mapping, you map into the spherical space. And these spherical space, they do have nice clustering structure if you reuse k-means or Gaussian mixed model. You redo it, give a different k, you find different things. This time becomes very meaningful. Okay, that means bird contain hidden information, just too implicit. You cannot bring them out. You have to do some tricks to bring this implicit information out. Okay. Yeah, popularity counts. Yeah, the, here that's that's a very good observation. It does because some document contain this word many times. Okay. This one, you original, you map into each word, uh, which word is more important, you don't know, okay? Because it's a whole bird mapping. But now you have document, document, this document contain more words. We are not using the original words, but we use a bird embedding. But the bird embedding, you, for example, you get a politics appear many times, the politics become more important. It will show up, then that clustering structure will show up. Yes. So if you were doing it with the other approach, say, I don't know, word to vector, then you would do the similar thing in finding the, 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 the original Yeah, space. that's a very good question. We actually show the performance. We compare with the word to vec and uh, many other embeddings. And this one actually give you better results, both empirically, that means qualitatively and quantitatively. We did show that. But my question for the list, is mapping the spherical space improves any embedding sort of uh, method? Or? Uh, that one we we did not we did not try it. We tried this one essentially bird base. Okay, but you can try. For example, you get GPT. You get a, you know like a Roberta, whatever. You can try this. What we believe is because you can dig this embedding out. Other preaching language model should do the same. But we did not try it, we dare not to say. But this one shows a bird base. If you do this transformation, it becomes very effective. You can give me any kind of K. You say K is 100, K is 20, I give you very nice clusters. Okay, that means you need somehow to dig out this deeply embedded information out. Okay, it's too implicit, yes. No, it's the same number of dimensions. Yeah. Uh, actually, dimension itself is, is not that important. As long as you keep, for example, you say 400 or 500, that's, that should be good enough. Yeah. But essentially, it's, it's just that this embedding was too thorough. Okay. You make the original distribution. That's exactly like you said. You also lost the numer uh, whether which one is more popular, which one is less popular. You still need document information there, okay? But you need a bird embedding, okay? So uh, you need both somehow. Uh, you actually can see once you do clustering, you we still use this EM algorithm to do expectation maximization. You using this? This is similar to k-means, but it's like a soft k-means if you know the EM algorithm, right? So then you see visualization, you see every epoch, the, the embedding start changing dramatically. You can see, we take the same k, but at the very beginning, same k means each k is, a, is one color, okay? So now you see this original epoch zero, it's kind of a color, but the color scatter everywhere. You actually can see like a green color is scattered anywhere, the green one, right? So then you get an epoch two, epoch four, epoch eight. By the last epoch, epoch eight, you actually can see very nice clustering structure already formed, right? So that means simply says originally, if you directly look at a bird embedding, they are so scattered. But now if you start using this transformed space, 
you use k-means to start going down there, you actually can see it becomes very good, right? Now, if you look at, that's exactly we do the comparison, okay? The method is the last row called top class. That means topic cluster, top class. But we use BERT and then we use a transform space. We compare with LDA, compare with core, core EX, ETM, and a BERT topic. BERT topics, BERT directly work on topic. That means somebody did take the BERT and they try the topic models. They got a BERT topic. But if you look at this, Actually, if you look at the divisive one, the last row, the last column, RDA actually was not that bad. It got the divisive 0 0.78. But if you look at bird topic, actually they could not even beat RDA on this particular one, but other things uh, generally better. But if you look at top class, it's almost every entry, you get a dramatic difference. The evaluation metric is, uh, these several evaluation metric actually was more like a standard. Uh, I forgot this. Uh, this one is the in, in integration, the other is division, divisive. That means how the cluster, how they they can divide each other. How, yeah, the, is how you can separate the cluster nicely. Okay, so you probably can see like uh, top class, the division part almost can get 0 0.99, 0 0.96. That means you really can separate the cluster very nicely, okay? Uh, this is an analytical one, but you can look at the real results. You probably get it a little interesting. Because you use K, we do not know the origin of each topic. It's really mean what? But after observation, we give a number, uh, give a name, okay? For example, you look at New York Times. The first one we say sports, the second one politics, the third one is research, the fourth one France, the fifth one is Japan, okay? Of course, it's what we observe, what they generally finally give a name, okay? But you look at the cluster, you probably will be convinced because you look at the topic sports, you look at down part, you get athletes, medalists, Olympics, tournaments, quarterfinal, okay? But if you look at the RDA, what do you get? You get Olympic, you did, but you get a year, you get set, you get games, you get team. So it's very much mixed. Even now you run RDA, no matter who you run it, you always can find, there are a bunch of words, it's, it's quite messy, mix things together inside, okay? So the same thing, if you look at uh, like a Japan, France, you, you probably can see France, you get French, Seine, uh, Toulouse, Marseille, and Paris. Paris. And the uh, same thing as Japan, you get all these nice words. Remember this one does not, nobody give you any seat, nobody get any, give you any supervision. You just based on the New York Times itself. Then you take a K, they will generate this. And this is very useful for topic analysis. You clearly see, right? Because you get a, a document say what it is about. And you get those words, they say, oh, this is about Japan, right? So that's pretty useful. Okay. Oh, total is about uh, 200. These were just, uh, this is just a pickup, randomly pick a five. The, these were like top rank keywords? Or what? Yeah, these are the top rank keywords. Yeah. So, this one is a complete unsupervised. That means I do not know, I do not give you any hint. Uh, you just do it. I just give you a number, like 200, okay. If you have some evaluation on this, like, uh, I don't know if you have some label, somebody would label the full topic and then how many of these Japanese words were in Japan or- Right, so that's a very good point. <laughs> Actually, that's exactly we subsequently we develop it, we call seed guided because this one is completely no seed. Since it's no seed that you base on cluster, clustering comparing to classification. Classification give you some kind of user guidance or classification label. Usually the classification will beat clustering. Because what I'm saying is that, you know, 
you get embedding and then you map them to some you know sphere then this and that but maybe you how to say hallucinate the process meaning that with some kind of uh algorithm you can always collapse some cluster somewhere and then you can measure oh you know it's a very nice cohesive cluster but right. are they in Good yes, yes, that, that, okay, the later you actually, you see the subsequent seed guided one, you will become in seed guided one is better. Okay, yeah, yes. So where, where did the labels in this example come from? Sport, yeah, this label is, we observe the results, we give a label to help people understand it. Okay, right. but, okay. yeah. Yes. So next section is human giving you the label. For example, you say, I'm interested in that. I, I, I can immediately just show you this before I, uh, I got the video, okay? Human give you the label, you will cluster it differently. I give you this, this two charts you can see is we take six people, okay? Richard Feynman, Isaac Newton, Theresa May, Donna Trump, William Shakespeare, Mark Twain. Obviously, when we do this, Trump was still there. The Theresa May, Theresa May was there. We just took the two people, we put it down there. But you probably can see this. Okay. If you say I'm interested in politics, science, and literature, the six names were part, you will be clustering this way. You if you like it you like it to be clustering this way, okay? But if you say, I'm interested in England versus US, okay? You will be clustering completely different way because you will put Mark Twain, Donna Trump, and Richard Feynman in this similar closer cluster because they are from US. But this cannot be done using BERT or using any kind of embedding. We know. Because embedding is independent. You get a big documents, you take every cluster, you, you calculate every word's embedding is fixed. You cannot say, I'm interested in US, I put Mark Twain and Donald Trump together. Okay, I'm interested in literature, then I put William Shakespeare and Mark Twain together. You cannot do that because your word is the person like a William Shakespeare only have one embedding. You cannot shift it around to be closer to Mark Twain or Chris closer to Theresa May, right? So that's a completely different way to do embedding. That why we call seed guided from the embedding, from the embedding point of view, we redo the embedding. Then whatever you like, we'll put them together nicely. That is a little go beyond the cluster. That means we do we do not first do embedding. We actually, based on your goal, we do the embedding. Okay, then we'll see how it, it can be done. I will first broadcast a video because after video, we can have discussion why this is the best way, this is a better way, but it could be very useful for, for the text analysis. Okay, let me first get into this video. Okay, let me see whether, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, this one. I would like to introduce the second line of the screen. Full screen. Okay. Yeah. So this could be full screen. Oh, okay. This is better than my important structure. See the value of property structure. So, first, why do we need to see the value of property structure? That may explain two major limitations of unsupervised property structure. First, Unsupervised public discovery cannot incorporate user files. They tend to retrieve the most general and prominent copies from a test section. These copies may not be of a user's particular interest, and they may provide a skewed and biased summarization of the topic. 
Second, the function of my problem is that we cannot enforce the incidence to incidence among the two topics. Let's give an example here. Here are three topics received by LDA on the real time data set. We can see that it is difficult to clearly define the meaning of the three topics based on overlap of their semantics. In fact, the term United States appears in all three topics. So in this case, what is the expected output? Here we define seed guided discriminated topic mind. To be specific, given a text corpus and a set of category names, the task is to retrieve a set of terms that exclusively belong to each category. For example, if the user gives three seeds to United States, France, and Canada, Ontario can be expected under, under Canada because it is a province in Canada and exclusively belongs to Canada. However, North America should be, not be uh, extracted under any country because it is a broader tense compact in comparison with the three seeds. English should not be retrieved under Canada as well because it is also relevant to the United States. So it is not, uh, it does not discriminatively belong to any country. Here we can see two major differences of seed guided discriminated problem from other models. First, the task requires a set of user provided category names and only focuses on retrieving terms belonging to the given categories. Second, the task imposes strong discriminated requirements that each retrieved term under the corresponding category must belong to and only belong to that category semantically. Given the task, I will introduce three uh, major related studies. The first one, Kate, is a pioneering work which uses text embedding techniques in a uh, discriminated part of mind. In the second work, George, we extend Kate to hierarchical part of mind by jointly modeling the tree and text in the spherical embedding case. Both Kate and George use static text embeddings only and uh, do not exploit the power of frictionality models. So in our most recent work, see the topic one, we try to integrate first based representations into this time. Let me start from Kate. Uh, we know that word embedding techniques such as word to bed have some advantages over LDA. They can capture word semantic correlations via the distributional hypothesis. That said, they can capture local context similarities, such as the plus minus five word. This goes beyond the bag of words, a generative assumption of LDA, in which case uh, the order of those words is completely ignored. However, word embedding also has some Drawbacks. For example, word to back does not exploit the bottom the level statistics uh, uh, or global context. What if some semantic signals are beyond the plus minus five word, but still in the document? Second, word to back does not exploit, uh, does not model topics. No matter what seeds or category names are given, the output embedding space remains the same. In spite of this, we propose case category name guided embedding, which leverages category names to learn word embeddings with discriminated power over the specific set of categories. Let's see an example here. Suppose we want to uh, embed six celebrities. Uh, if the user given category names are politics, science, and literature, then the whole embedding space should be divided into subspaces according to these topics. For example, Richard Feynman and Isaac Newton should be embedded closer in one subspace in this case, and Theresa May and Donald Trump should be embedded closer. However, if the user provides category names uh, such as England and the United States, then the embedding space should be divided according to location, and Theresa May and Isaac Newton should be embedded closer in this case. So this is the expected embedding output. Technically, we still uh, adopt a text generated process, which bears some similarity with LDA. However, we have several uh, major modifications here. First, we propose to model text generation under user guidance. Uh, in this case, we propose a three step process. In the first process, uh, where the embedding space needs to consider topic assignment, 
A document D is generally a condition on one of the N categories. And in the second step, we try to model global context where each word is generated a condition on the semantics of the document. This step is similar, but has its counterpart in LDA. In the third step, we try to model local context, like plus minus five words. Um, in this step, the surrounding words in the local context window are generated a condition on the semantics of the central group. And by observing the whole corpus, we can compute the likelihood of corpus generation condition on user given categories based on the whole text generation process. And the embedding learning objective is essentially the log likelihood of the whole generation process, where we can see three terms here uh, corresponding to the three steps in the generation story, respectively. Now the problem becomes how to instantiate each of these conditional probabilities. The simplest solution is just to borrow the softmax function from word to back. But here we make some uh, modifications by introducing word distributional specificity, where we assume there is a non massive scalar kappa correlated with each word, indicating how specific the word meaning is. The bigger kappa is, the more specific meaning the word has, and the less varying context the word uh, should appear in. Similar to the embedding method, the specificity is also a learnable parameter during embedding learning. And uh, uh, it is expected that the learner specificity of seafood is higher than the learner specificity of food. For more details about how we add specificity into this conditional probability, we can refer to the case paper. So after learning the embedding vector and the specificity of each word, we can propose to retrieve category representative words. Here we propose a ranking method. Uh, it considers two factors. First, it prefers words having high embedding cosimilarity with the category name in the embedding space. And then it prefers words with low distributional specificity, which means it is more general. However, there's one important additional constraint. The retrieved word must be more specific than the category name. Uh, this echoes our previous example of North America and Canada. So the retrieved category representative words are the minor properties under each key. We conduct experiments on two data sets, New York Times, which is a corpus of use, and the Yelp, which is a data set of uh, food reviews. In each data set, there are two dimensions of category. In the New York Times data set, the two dimensions are topic and the location. And in the Yelp data set, the two dimensions are food types and the sentiments. We can see that uh, Kate outperforms many classic topic models, such as LDA, heated LDA, and anchor correlates, as well as embedding based topic models, such as labeled EPM, in terms of two evaluation metrics, TC and MACC. Here, TC stands for term uh, topic coherence. Uh, which evaluates how uh, frequently those retrieved terms, for example, top 10 retrieved terms, they co occur with each other in the, uh, in the uh, corpus. MACC uh, evaluates the term accuracy, uh, whether the, each of the top 10 retrieved terms is relevant or discriminatingly relevant to the corresponding category name. We also show the qualitative results here. For each dimension in each data set, we selected two categories. Again, the category names are the only supervision for embedding learning here. And we show the top five terms retrieved by these compared methods. We can find that uh, the, the terms retrieved by Kate are more accurate than those terms retrieved by uh, the base bonds. Uh, because the distributional specificity is a normal problem in Kate, we show its effect uh, by uh, through a case study. Here, the table lists the most similar words or phrases with each category matched by the embedding cosine similarity from different ranges of distributional specificity. You can see that when kappa is smaller, the retrieved words have wider semantic coverage. For example, under science, if kappa is smaller, we can see research and the laboratory here. When kappa becomes larger, you can see more specific things, such as 
National Science Foundation and the George Washington University. You can see that in our model design, it's not imposing constraints on Kappa, the restricted word might be too general and it does not belong to the corresponding tag. Okay, now let me introduce the job framework for hierarchical public mind. Yeah, let me break it here. Uh, how I can break it? Organized into a hierarchy. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I don't want to keep uh, distributing, you get bored. So the first thing is you probably get a feeling uh, what this really means is you want to redo the embedding. Okay? Not a, like a word to back, uh, not even like a spherical embedding. You redo the embedding based on user guidance. Users say, I want this and this and this. Then you embed it based on user needs. You do this embedding. Then based on this embedding, you actually can, can do the ranking because the embedding is closer to your seed, it's more specific to your seed, and it's clustered around your seed. Okay, there's no specific clustering algorithm because this whole embedding space, you know, putting things inside already. Okay, so you have any question related to this? You probably can see the general results are really impressive. Uh, why? Just because embedding itself is very useful. But the BERT embedding or word to vacuum embedding is they, they are aimless. That means they want to embed anything everybody can use, but not necessarily you like it. Yeah. Right. You actually can see is you. It depends on what you give me. For example, we give you example. You give me say U.S., Canada, and France. Okay. You give me these three countries, then English and French cannot be discriminative because Canada both English and French, and the U.S. is English or France is in French. So these languages can cannot be so useful to discriminate this. But Paris or Washington DC, uh, Toronto probably will be very useful, right? You probably can see this. That means when you calculate this, your embedding calculation based on your goal, I do the embedding based on all the correlation statistics. So whatever you need, I redo the embedding, but embed embedding actually is really, really fast. Okay, we actually did a KDD demo right on the spot. Some Google research people came, look at this. And he gave us a very tough problem, said, what's the corpus inside? I say, it's Wikipedia. Then they say, what about this? Okay, I want you to distinguish, to give you this. Data mining, machine learning. Okay, then it runs. It's very interesting because this one, lots of people say this data mining machine learning is mixed up. I just cannot distinguish them. Then they, based on the two seeds they give, the, the data mining, they have like association rule, those uh, frequent patterns there, but they also have lots of applications. They have like time series analysis or spatial temporal or something. Lots of applications is in the data mining. But on the machine learning, they have lots of methods like a naive base or like a, a prob probability models or something really in the machine learning part. So it's, it's, we look at it, it's automatically generated, but it's very nicely dis distinguished. But if you give me other completely different things, we will give you completely different embedding. Okay, but that embedding, if you really look at the embedding, what you see is, let me just get into the original uh, slides. Uh, it's here, right? This one. Let me see. My, I'm not quite getting used to it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we probably, okay. Yeah. If you look at the real calculation, essentially just this one formula, okay? This one formula, the difference is this, okay? If you look at uh, what uh, Wartovac was doing this, 
World VAC Essential is the very last one. These three products, very last one, World VAC is compute your neighbor occurrences of the other words. That means essentially WI, then under WI, you compute what's the probability of WI plus J. I plus J, J is from minus K to plus K, right? That's exactly what World VAC is doing. But if you look at the center one, center one essentially is topic modeling is doing. Topic modeling, you give me a document, what's the chance to get this word? This is topic modeling is doing. The first one essentially is putting category inside. You give me, say, I want to distinguish Canada, US, and France. I give it the seeds. This seeds is C under category D, right? That document actually determines the first probability. Now you see this formula is so simple, but it's very powerful. Essentially, word to back, topic model, and your guidance all put inside to recompute this embedding. Now it becomes so powerful. You almost can't do anything you like. And without a human, right? Human needed just exactly like this Google research guy said. You give me the words, data mining and machine learning. They are going to generate those words to really distinguish data mining and machine learning, all based on their new embedding. So you can see, and you can give me anything you like. I will do, based on large corpus, I will regenerate these topics you need, right? So you probably can see that's a pretty interesting one. You, uh, that, that's just one article about this. But later I have more, but I, with a limited time, I probably won't, don't want to broadcast the, play the whole student video because otherwise we're run out of time. Uh, but you probably know this is the one, it becomes quite interesting, okay? And you see the results, it also shows it's very nicely, you can dis distinguish them, okay? And you can distinguish by control the kappa, you can make it more general or more specific as well. Yes, question. Right. The input are the documents. That means you, you can give me say 20 documents or 100 documents, whatever. They have the particular words distributed in their documents. You don't have an initial computation. This is just initial document put in. Okay, you don't have a other thing. This is more like a word to back. When you compute this, you also use a bunch of documents, try to compute the embedding. That's the same thing. But the only difference is here, your embedding is based on what a user needs. It's not like a bird or word of act. Yeah. Yes. No, no. You don't really train them because you actually can see what you computed just based on this formula. You take this products, so you, you take a log, you get log likelihood, you get a summation. Right, you based on this, you compute the uh, the whole for every word you compute its embedding. Then the most highly embedded under this seeds are the ranked under this seed. Okay, uh, you you have different seeds like United States, Canada, and France. You actually can can get a document from suppose you get New York Times. Uh, you actually can distinguish what are the differences. Right. It's, it, this is based on the documents you give. The whole computation is based on document you give. Word frequencies, actually, all of these are the probability. They all have a frequency as a component inside. Yes, they have the frequency inside. You, you actually can see that, right? It looks very simple, but very powerful. And actually it's very fast as well, because when we show this is right in front of the Google researcher in the conference demo. They just say, 
<laughs> give me give me this so then we actually show you know we ourselves never run and compare machine learning with data mining they give us a tough problem but it, once it generated everybody got surprised it's almost like human right okay so with this philosophy i quickly show what other two papers are not following exactly the student one because we can have more uh, collaboration uh, communication with this this is single level one level what about you give me multi levels okay this josh is right you can see this triple w is in april kdd actually in august that's so four months later we, we publish another paper is josh josh is a hierarchical we call it joint spherical and a tree embedding the joint both tree embedding and spherical embedding putting inside to do the hierarchical one. The hierarchical one, I'll give you an example like this, okay? That means when you give me, you are not just giving me one level, you give me multi-levels. You give me like a sports versus arts. Under sports, you have baseball and soccer. Under arts, you give music and dance, okay? Now you say, take this tree, generate all the topics I like from your corpus. That's what you get, okay? Now, of course, the formula, I'm not going to get into detail, but I just show you the results, okay? The results, this one is from New York Times, okay? What you see is the root, the, 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 the header, the, the blue ones are the given ones. The white ones are the generated ones. Yes. You can say that formula root is just the, just the previous approach, but then the topics below was yes. what we wanted. If you think the results is very low, then actually the root is virtual. Okay. What you have is sports. Under sports, you get a princess. You get a hockey, golf, baseball, soccer. Yeah, I mean, instead of having sports and below quality, like forget about sports science and just. I see. The then. Okay, that's an interesting question. That means you put everything in parallel. Okay, but that may not get a very good results. The reason is there are lots of words related to hockey also related to sports. So it's, it becomes more like you try to fight with your brother within the same family, right? That make a bloody fighting because what's the sports left? <laughs> Every of their children actually grab the, the keywords they need, right? So that, that makes things too hard. So, but if you get a structure, you actually can see some general ones put in there and some specific one go, go down. Yeah, so that, that's automatically can generate three of topics you like. That's based on user guidance. Let me simply say user, say I like this kind of structure, you go down to a large corpus, you can dig out automatically. Okay. Uh, yes. I'm not sure I understand. Let's say I understand the lowest level of this uh, hockey seed. It probably has all these keywords around it embedded. But if you have sports, it's higher seed. And that's his tournament. So how the tournament embedding would be looking in this uh, vertical embedding space where it's it might be also close to baseball, but not to soccer, and then... Right. The key becomes this, okay. Things dedicated to hockey, actually is within hockey. Things cannot be distinguished, like you said, tournament. Maybe hockey and baseball both have it. That time, the, the tournament will not be put into hockey and baseball too. They were put on the higher level. But I just don't get the vision of how, what will be the embedding then? The, how you, okay. How the, the, right. the embedding, remember the Kate, this category guided embedding is try, you use this formula, try to distinguish each category. This one, the, at the lower end, you still do this. But the tree embedding, the general philosophy, if you look at the original one, you actually can see that if you look at the spherical one, sports, you have tennis, you have baseball, you have soccer. They surrounding these sports in a spherical space. But each one has their point, their local region. Right? If you look at think, think about embedding, this is both spherical embedding 
and the tree embedding combined, you put it down there. So tournament would be more in this sort of center of sports? Yes, it's closer to sports rather than close to anyone because every one of them, they try to grab them, they also try to compete. And finally, nobody can get it, but their parents will get it. But then what happens if you have, I don't know, uh, baseball uh, is a thousand times more popular than than some other sport, and then they would grab it anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. If you get a, some very rarely, suppose you get a term. Uh, tennis is using it in other sports, but very, very rarely in counter sport will use this term as well. Likely, this one will have more power to grab it. So that means when you make a tree, mm -hmm. you assume that the frequencies within each leaf are sort of balanced? It's, it's really based on the competition of those formulas. You probably can see the formula. If you look at the initial one, the initial formula is very easy to understand is this, okay? Everything is conditional probability. If you are much more popular than the other, your conditional probability will benefit you instead of the other guy. So final competition, you are going to win. It's just a, it's a kind of quantitative competition, right? You have more seeds or more occurrences, they have more power. The conditional probability will be bigger, right? So you, actually it is in your mind in, in the design, but when you really look at the experimental result, it confirms those things, the probability will not lie, right? So it, it, it comes more, you will, will get more, okay? So that's the one I just show you the, the, this actually is based on the tree. You also can get very good results on this. Like, and this one is about the science. You actually can see mass, physics, and computer science. And under computer science, you get natural language processing, pattern recognition, networking, program languages, game theory. You actually can see each one, like game theory, you have a decision problem, influence diagram, two player, or Nash equilibrium, all down there. You probably can see the terms, even in computer science, you can distinguish really nicely. Yeah. I bet SQL in a database or anything like that, you will go down to the database, right? So you probably can see it's quite natural. And yes, go ahead. The word uh, ball, that only sport that ball, so totally ball will land in the sport. Yes. Right? right. So if you have some sports like uh, hockey and badminton or athletics, then ball would actually end up in their hockey. It's likely. Okay. You actually can see, even within this example, the output, you can see it's interesting because you we give you the four seats. Hockey, golf, baseball, and soccer. We did not give you basketball. Okay. Then they push the basketball into sports because none of them can compete the basketball, but basketball does belong to sports. That's why basketball, basketball shows up. So it's, it's really depends on what you give. Then they do what you, you like. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's quite nice. It's a human can control it, right? I think that's nice and rather than blindly, you just ask, uh, you know, like a chat GPT, they do not know what you intend, right? <clears throat> okay, so this is about the hierarchical one. Then what we see is the C topic mind, this newer paper just published last month in Wisdom was mainly try to further explore the power to make sure the seeds are very nicely seeded into things you need, okay? And that one is using multiple games. Uh, the Kate algorithm was inside and we look at uh, inside this, there are many other things. I, uh, there are three algorithms intertwined, okay, essentially, they mutually help each other. And then we can get a very good results. Uh, we still take arts for science to see what the results we can get. We actually took three things. One is the seed-guided text embedding. That's a Kate algorithm we just introduced. 
One is bird embedding. We also take a bird embedding because bird consider more context. And we also take a text classification. We dynamic finding sentences within the documents because you actually can see each document, people discuss multiple topics. So some sentence, the surrounding ones also means the sentence, but they don't have that related words. You graph these things inside as well, then you find it. So that's why you take a text classification, BERT, and seed guided topic discovery. Three things mutually enhancing each other, you get even stronger results, okay? So uh, I probably just show you, and we compare with the Kate we, discuss, we discovered three years ago. Okay, you, we can show actually these like uh, France versus Canada or sushi versus dessert or seafood versus steak or something like this. We can find even better result. So that means you don't need a human uh, supervision, but you need human guidance. Say so what I like, you just at the top level, you say it. Then this topic discovery will go down to the corpus mind what you need to get it. Okay, so uh, that's about this one. Okay, this one we, uh, because we have only 10, 12 minutes left, I'm not going to give you all things, but I just show some interesting ones. Maybe you find in your practice, it could be useful. Then uh, you may you may likely get it. This one is about weekly supervised text classification. What is weekly supervised text classification? That means if you text can be as small as one sentence, as big as a, like a very large documents, like a book. Okay, so classification means. You give me a bunch of things. I put the, the thing, for example, you say sentiment analysis. You may say, I like it or hate it or neutral, like a you know, year for review. Then what you need is you take a document, maybe just a sentence, maybe a message about a year for review. So whether this review is positive or negative or neutral, okay, you, you automatically put it in. And the topic of the paper is the same. For example, you say, oh, in this EDP key conference, you get a paper. Say, is this one is about a query optimization or is about transaction processing, is about, you know, like a XML or something you want to put into different things. The topic will automatically grab this document and put it in the right place, okay? But the, in the past, how people do this is you give me lots of training examples. That means if you want to say whether this one is positive, this one negative, you need people to give you say uh, 200 documents. I first train it, I give you labels, the remaining documents you do by machine, okay? The problem becomes first, it involves lots of human, okay? And a human may disagree with each other. A human may have errors. It's very costly. It's not scalable, okay? Another problem is what about you have a very large space? Just thinking about it in computer science, okay? How big this computer science tree is, okay? And we originally thinking you can do like a 10 class, 20 classes, then Microsoft research look at the paper, then they come back, say, that's not enough. They give us a simple example. In academic, how many classes in there, they call a Microsoft academic graph, okay? How many nodes there? 25,000. Can you randomly pick a paper, putting into the right 25,000 leaves? That means that you, you say this paper is about what? Without anybody, human give you supervision, can you put it in the right place? And that's exactly, you actually can see we have one paper working together with Microsoft Research, we did it, okay? The general philosophy for this is we call labor only classification. That means we don't need anybody trained. 
but you have to give me meaningful labels. What is meaningful label? Means this label meaningful to human and also occur frequently in your corpus, okay? Uh, for example, you give me RDA, I will have a hard time because the RDA may mean different thing. Like it could be linear discriminant analysis or something. But if you give me politics, sports, or education history, I will do a good job. Okay, then you will see how this whole thing can be done. Okay, I with limited eight minutes. I don't. Uh, is this we finish at five thirty, right? Eight minutes. I will just uh, show you quickly what can be done because of limited time. Okay, the first thing is single label versus multi label. That means. Whether you want to say this document, I only give one label, say this one is a query processing or given multi-labels. Maybe this is a query processing, distributed processing, stream processing or something all down there because it's on the stream query, right? So I can give you a multi-query. And I can give you a flat and hierarchical. That means I can give you a top is sports, going down is hockey, going down is something like a, you know, a particular NHL team, right? So I can give you this. And weekly means how weak it is. We try to find the weakest one is labor only. That means you only have a meaning for labor in your tree. That's it. You don't give me anything. Can we do it? Okay. So we actually show you can, you can do it in a very high quality, actually. I will not get into this because of limited time. I will not get into this. But I will show you the the the... The first algorithm called lot class. What means lot? Lot means labor only text classification. We just uh, compress it into lot class. Okay. Labor only text classification is you give me a, a piece of text, but you only give me the what's a class you want. The remaining one is we use pre trained language model BERT. Okay. And we can get lots of keywords. Really, keywords. For example, you say sports, history, or you know politics, and we are going to take sports, history, and politics. Go down to say your large corpus, like a New York Times. Dig out what words, keywords, really related to sports, what related to to politics, or related to history. Okay, but then you may say, wait, what about I give you different seats instead of say politics sports or history, I give you politics, religion, and war or something like this. Actually, originally, your religion and war maybe belongs to politics. But now you say, no, 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 I give you a new class label. I give you politics, give you war, give you religion. What do you do? You immediately can see, this is like a discriminant mining. You will see the religion words actually really not go to politics will go down directly to religion, okay? And uh, war will go to war if not go down to politics. You actually can see the differences. Then with this, you can see this uh, sup supervised one, the bird is still the champion because what is supervised one? You give almost one third or sometimes two thirds labeled. That means you give me hundreds of thousands of labels then I can do this. But this, the weekly supervised one, ours, which is a lot class, is you only need to give me three words, politics, sports, and history. That's it. You don't give me anything. But how far we can get, you look at this AG News, DVPDA, IMDB, Amazon, we got all around 0 0.9. That means we almost can achieve the performance of fully supervised model, okay? This one was published in EMRP 2020, okay? After that, that, there are lots of follow-ups because people got excited. They say, you don't need to give me labor. You only give me the, the, the class name, that's it. Then they are uh, X class, they show they actually can beat us. They can do something better. Uh, they are, you probably can see they compete with a lot of class. Uh, that one published the second year, 2021. Then the newest work actually is ours again. The newest work we just submitted, not published yet. It's still under review, but I can show you what it is, okay? Because the previous work, work 
all based on keywords. They're using keywords to distinguish it. But sometimes the keyword alone is not enough. It just give you one Yelp review, okay? Yelp review about the food, okay? There's a one, one guy write a very short review, say, it is to die for. You know, it's positive or negative? Of course, positive, because the food is so good, it's to die for. But which word means positive? Die is very negative, right? It's to die for. Nobody will say, based on the keyword, you can distinguish this one is positive. Okay. The problem becomes who can do it. Actually, pre-trained language model can do it. You think about this. You, you, you feed into bird. You feed into this Roberta or something, not to feed to a GPT-3. You feed into that, they can correctly identify this. Now, the interesting thing is preaching language model not always right, but sometimes they are, they are superior comparing to human keywords. So finally, we have to integrate the keywords and the preaching language model working together. We derive a new method called prompt class. That means how to make good use of a prompt. And then integrate the prompt classification and the keyword-based recognition together. Finally, you can wait. Okay. So we actually show how to make this whole thing work. Finally, if you see the results, you probably can see the very last one is fully supervised. And the second the last one, Electra, Electra is prompt class. You actually can see, especially for Yelp, IMDB, these are the sentiment analysis one. And we almost got the same as fully supervised one. But if you look at the original law class, X class, they are around 0 0.87. And here we get 0 0.95. That means you actually integrating keywords with preaching language model working together, guard each other becomes the most powerful way to do it. And with this, using single class name, you almost can do what a human give you 100,000 labels. So that actually is pretty amazing. We got very excited with this. Simply says, remember originally you, people hired so many people to do annotation labeling. If you can do this, you basically say, machine can do it, okay? And because those things are very tedious, you think about this. You get 100,000 ones, you get a tree of things, you try to find which one match which, it's very tedious for intellectuals, okay? And you need expert to, to, to labor it. Now you see, actually there's a potential, you don't need a human, you need a machine to do it. Okay, so I think I finished. The time is up, I will not give you more, but you probably can see it's a very exciting frontier. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, you go ahead. You. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You are interested in the work that appears less for low data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we apply this method to you know, eventually by indexing the papers so, and then still obtain good results in the long term chain of, of uh, zip for power law? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, if it's a very low frequency, like only occur once, actually it's very hard to do. Very hard. Very hard to do. But uh, as long as it go over once, we actually have a way to do it. Because uh, if it occur more, because otherwise, if it only occur once, any combination could be candidate. It's, it's exponential. But if it's twice, you were originally from ex exponential, you almost go down to linear, even if it's a very large linear. That's why it becomes controllable. So we do have some, some studies. If you need, you like some paper, I can give you some paper. That one is about our freeze mining. 
we show you need it or for for get a phrase at least you need twice you you say once you get it exponential number of candidates it's just too too big to handle but twice it becomes quite controllable okay thank you very yeah much. thank you yes uh, just uh, coming back to your uh, motivation slides in the, in the morning i saw that uh, one of your last figures were that you, know, you take the uh, you know there is this i mean it doesn't matter but the output was a knowledge graph so my yes. question is because up to now we didn't reach it yes yes a state of the art because extracting uh. <laughs> okay. Like the full menu of all the relations. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very, very good question. That means automatic construct knowledge graphs. Uh, we did in, in our part four, we did have some examples. Okay. But it's not fully done yet. It's still a very active uh, research topic within my own group. Okay. I have uh, two papers currently under review. Okay, uh, that's that also means nobody give you any supervision. You try to identify fine grain types. Just give you an example. Okay, suppose you have like a Biden and McCarthy got a friendly quote friendly meeting on you know budget or like a, the seating debt seating or something, but everybody knows who is Biden. Okay. But you have to think about the machine. Machine can easily you use a typical the current one. You can easily recognize in this sentence Biden actually is a person. Okay, uh, McCarthy is a person. You you can recognize this scale. But you want to go down to uh, Biden actually is a U.S. president. McCarthy actually U.S. Uh, say Congress speakman or something like this. If you want to go down you need a taxonomy, okay? And you need a related words. And how we can automatically do this without anybody give you any annotation, it becomes a very important thing. That's related to knowledge graph construction because you have to think about this knowledge has some kind of human typing down to the, for example, down to US present that actually needs some smartness. Otherwise, human annotation is not going to fly. So I just wonder, you say, so we have Wikipedia, it's pretty structured, we can, we can, so we have knowledge graphs here based on Wikipedia. I wonder if uh, now we compare, with say, latest state of the art of the automatic extractors and compare these knowledge graphs, how close would they be? Is it still far away or? Like, it's not far away. Not far, not far away. I think within two or three years, there will be breakthrough. Basically, yeah. Are... Yeah. But the interesting thing we should know is the preaching language model will help. Okay. That means if you think about this Biden thing, of course, you can say, without anybody giving me any supervision, how I know this, actually, the preaching language model will tell you a lot of things. But a preaching language model is not, uh, people are called greater, means it's not stable. Even Biden, they can give you three or four choices. Okay, because under different conditions, Biden may play different roles. So the preaching language model may give you not only politician, they probably can give you like a father or husband or something, because it is true, Biden is a father, depends on different conditions. So. You have to, based on this current context, take a preaching language model, give you a few hints. You take the taxonomy, finally you resolve it automatically. So that's the game actually currently we are investigating. That means preaching language model give you important hints, but unstable. How can we make this preaching language model under this context become very firm to give you the right one? That's actually the most important thing. Okay, but you know, I believe even my group in the next uh, several months, we're going to push out a few papers right on this topic. Yeah, we're working on it. Yes. Okay. 
around you, giving it to the students who are sitting in the law. They get connecting if they get other things that are the same level that you have that you get all the support. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, our part three are discussing this. I just did not get a chance to get it. Okay, we call it taxonomy expansion. Yeah. That means you give me part of the taxonomy. I try to base on corpus expand to get more new, new notes. That's exactly, I have a few students doing this. One student who did this generate a few papers, he was grabbed by Google research. Now he's in uh, Google research. Yeah, that's exactly that we call taxonomy expansion. That's a great, great observation. Yeah, I will, I will put those things into the swan, but it, yeah. yeah, we do have some other tutorials like a KDD. We have a KDD tutorial. Sometimes it's longer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what? Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you.